of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter One The day broke gray and dull. The clouds hung heavily, and there was a rawness in the air that suggested snow. A woman servant came into the room in which a child was sleeping and drew the curtains. She glanced mechanically at the house opposite, a stucco house with a portico, and went to the child's bed. "'Wake up, Philip,' she said. She pulled down the bedclothes, took him in her arms, and carried him downstairs. He was only half awake. "'Your mother wants you,' she said. She opened the door of a room on the floor below and took the child over to a bed in which a woman was lying. It was his mother. She stretched out her arms and the child nestled by her side. He did not ask why he had been awakened. The woman kissed his eyes and with thin small hands felt the warm body through his white flannel nightgown. She pressed him closer to herself. "'Are you sleepy, darling?' she said. Her voice was so weak that it seemed to come already from a great distance. The child did not answer but smiled comfortably. He was very happy in the large warm bed with those soft arms about him. He tried to make himself smaller still as he cuddled up against his mother, and he kissed her sleepily. In a moment he closed his eyes and was fast asleep. The doctor came forwards and stood by the bedside. "'Oh, don't take him away yet!' she moaned. The doctor, without answering, looked at her gravely. Knowing she would not be allowed to keep the child much longer, the woman kissed him again, and she passed her hand down his body till she came to his feet. She held the right foot in her hand and felt the five small toes, and then slowly passed her hand over the left one. She gave a sob. "'What's the matter?' said the doctor. "'You're tired.' She shook her head, unable to speak, and the tears rolled down her cheeks. The doctor bent down. "'Let me take him.' She was too weak to resist his wish, and she gave the child up. The doctor handed him back to his nurse. "'You'd better put him back in his own bed.' "'Very well, sir.' The little boy, still sleeping, was taken away. His mother sobbed now, broken-heartedly. "'What will happen to him, poor child?' The monthly nurse tried to quiet her, and presently, from exhaustion, the crying ceased. The doctor walked to a table on the other side of the room, upon which, under a towel, lay the body of a stillborn child. He lifted the towel and looked. He was hidden from the bed by a screen, but the woman guessed what he was doing. "'Was it a girl or a boy?' she whispered to the nurse. "'Another boy.' The woman did not answer. In a moment the child's nurse came back. She approached the bed. "'Master Philip never woke up,' she said. There was a pause, then the doctor felt his patient's pulse once more. "'I don't think there's anything I can do just now,' he said. "'I'll call again after breakfast.' "'I'll show you out, sir,' said the child's nurse. They walked downstairs in silence. In the hall the doctor stopped. "'You've sent for Mrs. Carey's brother-in-law, haven't you?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you know at what time he'll be here?' "'No, sir. I'm expecting a telegram.' "'What about the little boy? I should think he'd be better out of the way.' "'Miss Watkins said she'd take him, sir.' "'Who's she?' "'She's his godmother, sir. Do you think Mrs. Carey will get over it, sir?' The doctor shook his head. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 It was a week later— Philip was sitting on the floor in the drawing-room at Miss Watkins' house in Onslow Gardens. He was an only child and used to amusing himself. The room was filled with massive furniture, and on each of the sofas were three big cushions. There was a cushion, too, in each armchair. All these he had taken out, and, with the help of the gilt-route chairs, light and easy to move, had made an elaborate cave in which he could hide himself from the red Indians who were lurking behind the curtains. He put his ear to the floor and listened to the herd of buffaloes that raced across the prairie. Presently, hearing the door open, he held his breath so that he might not be discovered, but a violent hand piled away a chair and the cushions fell down. "'You naughty boy! Miss Watkin will be cross with you!' "'Hello, Emma,' he said. The nurse bent down and kissed him, then began to shake out the cushions and put them back in their places. "'Am I to come home?' he asked. "'Yes, I've come to fetch you.' 
you've got a new dress on. It was in 1885, and she wore a bustle. Her gown was of black velvet, with tight sleeves and sloping shoulders, and the skirt had three large flounces. She wore a black bonnet with velvet strings. She hesitated. The question she had expected did not come, and so she could not give the answer she had prepared. "'Aren't you going to ask how your mamma is?' she said at length. "'Oh, I forgot. How is mamma?" Now she was ready. "'Your mamma is quite well and happy. Oh, I am glad. Your mamma's gone away. You won't ever see her any more.' Philip did not know what she meant. "'Why not? Your mamma's in heaven.' She began to cry, and Philip, though he did not quite understand, cried too. Emma was a tall, big-boned woman with fair hair and large features. She came from Devonshire, and, notwithstanding her many years of service in London, had never lost the breadth of her accent. Her tears increased her emotion, and she pressed the little boy to her heart. She felt vaguely the pity of that child deprived of the only love in the world that is quite unselfish. It seemed dreadful that he must be handed over to strangers. But in a little while she pulled herself together. "'Your Uncle William is waiting in to see you,' she said. "'Go and say good-bye to Miss Watkin, and we'll go home.' "'I don't want to say good-bye,' he answered, instinctively anxious to hide his tears. "'Very well. Run upstairs and get your hat.' He fetched it, and when he came down Emma was waiting for him in the hall. He heard the sound of voices in the study behind the dining-room. He paused. He knew that Miss Watkin and her sister were talking to friends, and it seemed to him—he was nine years old—that if he went in they would be sorry for him. "'I think I'll go and say good-bye to Miss Watkin.' "'I think you'd better,' said Emma. "'Go in and tell them I'm coming,' he said. He wished to make the most of his opportunity. Emma knocked at the door and walked in. He heard her speak. "'Master Philip wants to say good-bye to you, miss.' There was a sudden hush of the conversation, and Philip limped in. Henrietta Watkin was a stout woman with a red face and dyed hair. In those days to dye the hair excited comment, and Philip had heard much gossip at home when his godmothers changed color. She lived with an elder sister who had resigned herself contentedly to old age. Two ladies whom Philip did not know were calling, and they looked at him curiously. "'My poor child,' said Miss Watkin, opening her arms. She began to cry. Philip understood now why she had not been in to luncheon, and why she wore a black dress. She could not speak. "'I've got to go home,' said Philip at last. He disengaged himself from Miss Watkin's arms, and she kissed him again. Then he went to her sister and bade her good-bye, too. One of the strange ladies asked if she might kiss him, and he gravely gave her permission. Though crying he keenly enjoyed the sensation he was causing. He would have been glad to stay a little longer, to be made much of, but felt they expected him to go, so he said that Emma was waiting for him. He went out of the room. Emma had gone downstairs to speak with a friend in the basement, and he waited for her on the landing. He heard Henrietta Watkins' voice. His mother was my greatest friend. I can't bear to think that she's dead. You oughtn't to have gone to the funeral, Henrietta, said her sister. I knew it would upset you. Then one of the strangers spoke. Poor little boy. It's dreadful to think of him quite alone in the world. I see he limps. Yes, he's got a club foot. It was such a grief to his mother. Then Emma came back. They called a hansom, and she told the driver where to go. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 When they reached the house Mrs. Carey had died in, it was in a dreary, respectable street between Notting Hill Gate and High Street, Kensington. Emma led Philip into the drawing-room. His uncle was writing letters of thanks for the wreaths which had been sent. One of them, which had arrived too late for the funeral, lay in its cardboard box on the hall-table. "'Here's Master Philip,' said Emma. Mr. Carey stood up slowly and shook hands with the little boy. Then, on second thoughts, he bent down and kissed his forehead. He was a man of somewhat less than average height, inclined to corpulence, with his hair worn long, arranged over the scalp so as to conceal his baldness. He was clean-shaven. 
His features were regular, and it was possible to imagine that in his youth he had been good-looking. On his watch-chain he wore a gold cross. "'You're going to live with me now, Philip,' said Mr. Carey. "'Shall you like that?' Two years before Philip had been sent down to stay at the vicarage after an attack of chicken-pox, but there remained with him a recollection of an attic and a large garden rather than of his uncle and aunt. Yes, you must look upon me and your Aunt Louisa as your father and mother. The child's mouth trembled a little. He reddened, but did not answer. Your dear mother left you in my charge. Mr. Carey had no great ease in expressing himself. When the news came that his sister-in-law was dying, he set off at once for London, but on the way thought of nothing but the disturbance in his life that would be caused if her death forced him to undertake the care of her son. He was well over fifty, and his wife, to whom he had been married for thirty years, was childless. He did not look forward with any pleasure to the presence of a small boy who might be noisy and rough. He had never much liked his sister-in-law. "'I'm going to take you down to Black Stable tomorrow, he said with Emma? The child put his hand in hers, and she pressed it. "'I'm afraid Emma must go away,' said Mr. Carey. "'But I want Emma to come with me.' Philip began to cry, and the nurse could not help crying, too. Mr. Carey looked at them helplessly. "'I think you'd better leave me alone with Master Philip for a moment.' "'Very good, sir.' Though Philip clung to her, she released herself gently. Mr. Carey took the boy on his knee and put his arm round him. "'You mustn't cry,' he said. "'You're too old to have a nurse now. We must see about sending you to school.' "'I want Emma to come with me,' the child repeated. "'It costs too much money, Philip. Your father didn't leave very much, and I don't know what's become of it. You must look at every penny you spend.' Mr. Carey had called the day before on the family solicitor. Philip's father was a surgeon in good practice and his hospital appointments suggested an established position, so that it was a surprise on his sudden death from blood poisoning to find that he had left his widow little more than his life insurance and what could be got for the lease of their house in Bruton Street. This was six months ago, and Mrs. Carey, already in delicate health, finding herself with child, had lost her head and accepted for the lease the first offer that was made. She stored her furniture and, at a rent which the person thought outrageous, took a furnished house for a year, so that she might suffer from no inconvenience till her child was born. But she had never been used to the management of money, and was unable to adapt her expenditure to her altered circumstances. The little she had slipped through her fingers in one way or another, so that now, when all expenses were paid, not much more than two thousand pounds remained to support the boy till he was able to earn his own living. It was impossible to explain all this to Philip, and he was sobbing still. "'You'd better go to Emma,' Mr. Carey said, feeling that she could console the child better than anyone. Without a word Philip slipped off his uncle's knee, but Mr. Carey stopped him. "'We must go tomorrow, because on Saturday I've got to prepare my sermon, and you must tell Emma to get your things ready to-day.' you can bring all your toys, and if you want anything to remember your father and mother by, you can take one thing for each of them. Everything else is going to be sold. The boy slipped out of the room. Mr. Carey was unused to work, and he turned to his correspondence with resentment. On one side of the desk was a bundle of bills, and these filled him with irritation. One especially seemed preposterous. Immediately after Mrs. Carey's death, Emma had ordered from the florist masses of white flowers for the room in which the dead woman lay. It was sheer waste of money. Emma took far too much upon herself. Even if there had been no financial necessity, he would have dismissed her. But Philip went to her and hid his face in her bosom and wept as though his heart would break. And she, feeling that he was almost her own son, she had taken him when he was a month old consoled him with soft words. She promised that she would come and see him sometimes, and that she would never forget him. And she told him about the country he was going to, and about her own home in Devonshire. Her father kept a turnpike on the high road that led to Exeter, and there were pigs in the sty, 
and there was a cow, and the cow had just had a calf till Philip forgot his tears and grew excited at the thought of his approaching journey. Presently she put him down, for there was much to be done, and he helped her to lay out his clothes on the bed. She sent him into the nursery to gather up his toys, and in a little while he was playing happily. But at last he grew tired of being alone and went back to the bedroom, in which Emma was now putting his things into a big tin box. He remembered then that his uncle had said he might take something to remember his father and mother by. He told Emma, and asked her what he should take. "'You'd better go into the drawing-room and see what you fancy.' "'Uncle William's there.' "'Never mind that. They're your own things now.' Philip went downstairs slowly and found the door open. Mr. Carey had left the room. Philip walked slowly round. They had been in the house so short a time that there was little in it that had a particular interest to him. It was a stranger's room, and Philip saw nothing that struck his fancy. But he knew which were his mother's things and which belonged to the landlord, and presently fixed on a little clock that he had once heard his mother say she liked. With this he walked rather disconsolately upstairs. Outside the door of his mother's bedroom he stopped and listened. Though no one had told him not to go in, he had a feeling it would be wrong to do so. He was a little frightened and his heart beat uncomfortably, but at the same time something impelled him to turn the handle. He turned it very gently, as if to prevent anyone within from hearing, and then slowly pushed the door open. He stood on the threshold for a moment before he had the courage to enter. He was not frightened now, but it seemed strange. He closed the door behind him. The blinds were drawn, and the room in the cold light of a January afternoon was dark. On the dressing-table were Mrs. Carey's brushes and the hand-mirror. In a little tray were hairpins. There was a photograph of himself on the chimney-piece and one of his father. He had often been in the room when his mother was not in it, but now it seemed different. There was something curious in the look of the chairs. The bed was made as though someone were going to sleep in it that night, and in a case on the pillow was a nightdress. Philip opened the large cupboard filled with dresses, and stepping in took as many of them as he could in his arms, and buried his face in them. They smelt of the scent his mother used. Then he opened the drawers filled with his mother's things and looked at them. There were lavender bags among the linen, and their scent was fresh and pleasant. The strangeness of the room left it, and it seemed to him that his mother had just gone out for a walk. She would be in presently, and would come upstairs to have nursery tea with him, and he seemed to feel her kiss on his lips. It was not true that he would never see her again. It was not true simply because it was impossible. He climbed up on the bed and put his head on the pillow. He lay there quite still. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Philip parted from Emma with tears, but the journey to Blackstable amused him, and when they arrived he was resigned and cheerful. Blackstable was sixty miles from London. Giving their luggage to a porter, Mr. Carey set out to walk with Philip to the vicarage. It took them little more than five minutes, and when they reached it Philip suddenly remembered the gate. It was red and five-barred, it swung both ways on easy hinges, and it was possible, though forbidden, to swing backwards and forwards on it. They walked through the garden to the front door. This was only used by visitors and on Sundays and on special occasions, as when the vicar went up to London or came back. The traffic of the house took place through a side door and there was a back door as well for the gardener and for beggars and tramps. It was a fairly large house of yellow brick with a red roof, built about five and twenty years before in an ecclesiastical style. The front door was like a church porch, and the drawing-room windows were gothic. Mrs. Carey, knowing by what train they were coming, waited in the drawing-room and listened for the click of the gate. When she heard it she went to the door. "'There's Aunt Louisa,' said Mr. Carey when he saw her, run and give her a kiss. Philip started to run, awkwardly trailing his club foot, and then stopped. 
Mrs. Carey was a little shriveled woman of the same age as her husband, with a face extraordinarily filled with deep wrinkles and pale blue eyes. Her gray hair was arranged in ringlets according to the fashion of her youth. She wore a black dress, and her only ornament was a gold chain from which hung a cross. She had a shy manner and a gentle voice. "'Did you walk, William?' she said almost reproachfully as she kissed her husband. "'I didn't think of it,' he answered, with a glance at his nephew. "'It didn't hurt you to walk, Philip, did it?' she asked the child. "'No, I always walk.' He was a little surprised at their conversation. Aunt Louisa told him to come in, and they entered the hall. It was paved with red and yellow tiles, on which alternately were a Greek cross and the Lamb of God. An imposing staircase led out of the hall. It was of polished pine, with a peculiar smell, and had been put in because, fortunately, when the church was reseated, enough wood remained over. The balusters were decorated with emblems of the four evangelists. "'I've had the stove lighted as I thought you'd be cold after your journey,' said Mrs. Carey. It was a large black stove that stood in the hall and was only lighted if the weather was very bad and the vicar had a cold. It was not lighted if Mrs. Carey had a cold. Coal was expensive. Besides, Mary Ann, the maid, didn't light fires all over the place. If they wanted all them fires they must keep a second girl. In the winter Mr. and Mrs. Carey lived in the dining-room so that one fire should do and in the summer they could not get out of the habit, so the drawing-room was used only by Mr. Carey on Sunday afternoons for his nap. But every Saturday he had a fire in the study, so that he could write his sermon. Aunt Louisa took Philip upstairs and showed him into a tiny bedroom that looked out on the drive. Immediately in front of the window was a large tree, which Philip remembered now because the branches were so low that it was possible to climb quite high up it. A small room for a small boy said Mrs. Carey. "'You won't be frightened at sleeping alone?' "'Oh, no.' On his first visit to the vicarage he had come with his nurse, and Mrs. Carey had had little to do with him. She looked at him now with some uncertainty. "'Can you wash your own hands, or shall I wash them for you?' "'I can wash myself,' he answered firmly. "'Well, I shall look at them when you come down to tea,' said Mrs. Carey. She knew nothing about children." After it was settled that Philip should come down to Blackstable, Mrs. Carey had thought much how she should treat him. She was anxious to do her duty, but now he was there she found herself just as shy of him as he was of her. She hoped he would not be noisy and rough, because her husband did not like rough and noisy boys. Mrs. Carey made an excuse to leave Philip alone, but in a moment came back and knocked at the door. She asked him, without coming in, if he could pour out the water himself. Then she went downstairs and rang the bell for tea. The dining-room, large and well-proportioned, had windows on two sides of it, with heavy curtains of red rep. There was a big table in the middle, and at one end an imposing mahogany sideboard with a looking-glass in it. In one corner stood a harmonium. On each side of the fireplace were chairs covered in stamped leather, each with an antimacassar. One had arms and was called the husband, and the other had none and was called the wife. Mrs. Carey never sat in the armchair. She said she preferred a chair that was not too comfortable. There was always lots to do, and if her chair had had arms she might not be so ready to leave it. Mr. Carey was making up the fire when Philip came in, and he pointed out to his nephew that there were two pokers. One was large and bright and polished and unused and was called the vicar, and the other, which was much smaller and had evidently passed through many fires, was called the curate. "'What are we waiting for?' said Mr. Carey. "'I told Mary Ann to make you an egg. I thought you'd be hungry after your journey.' Mrs. Carey thought the journey from London to Blacksable very tiring. She seldom travelled herself, for the living was only three hundred a year, and when her husband wanted a holiday, since there was not money for two, he went by himself. He was very fond of church congresses and usually managed to go up to London once a year, and once he had been to Paris for the exhibition and two or three times to Switzerland. Mary Ann brought in the egg and they sat down. The chair was much too low for Philip, and for a moment neither Mr. Carey nor his wife knew what to do. 
I'll put some books under him,' said Mary Ann. She took from the top of the harmonium the large Bible and the prayer-book from which the vicar was accustomed to read prayers, and put them on Philip's chair. "'Oh, William, he can't sit on the Bible,' said Mrs. Carey in a shocked tone. "'Can't you get him some books out of the study?' Mr. Carey considered the question for an instant. "'I don't think it matters this once if you put the prayer-book on the top, Mary Ann,' he said. "'The Book of Common Prayer is the composition of men like ourselves. It has no claim to divine authorship.' "'I hadn't thought of that, William,' said Aunt Louisa. Philip perched himself on the books, and the vicar, having said grace, cut the top off his egg. "'There,' he said, handing it to Philip, "'you can eat my top if you like.' Philip would have liked an egg to himself, but he was not offered one, so took what he could. "'How have the chickens been laying since I went away?' asked the vicar. "'Oh, they've been dreadful, only one or two a day.' "'How do you like that top, Philip?' asked his uncle. "'Very much, thank you. You shall have another on Sunday afternoon.' Mr. Carey always had a boiled egg at tea on Sunday, so that he might be fortified for the evening service. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Philip came gradually to know the people he was to live with, and by fragments of conversation, some of it not meant for his ears, learned a good deal both about himself and about his dead parents. Philip's father had been much younger than the vicar of Blackstable. After a brilliant career at St. Luke's Hospital, he was put on the staff and presently began to earn money in considerable sums. He spent it freely. When the parson set about restoring his church and asked his brother for a subscription, he was surprised by receiving a couple of hundred pounds. Mr. Carey, thrifty by inclination and economical by necessity, accepted it with mingled feelings. He was envious of his brother because he could afford to give so much, pleased for the sake of his church, and vaguely irritated by a generosity which seemed almost ostentatious. Then Henry Carey married a patient a beautiful girl but penniless, an orphan with no near relations, but of good family, and there was an array of fine friends at the wedding. The parson on his visits to her, when he came to London, held himself with reserve. He felt shy with her, and in his heart he resented her great beauty. She dressed more magnificently than became the wife of a hard-working surgeon, and the charming furniture of her house, the flowers among which she lived even in winter, suggested an extravagance which he deplored. He heard her talk of entertainments she was going to, and, as he told his wife on getting home again, it was impossible to accept hospitality without making some return. He had seen grapes in the dining-room that must have cost at least eight shillings a pound, and at luncheon he had been given asparagus two months before it was ready in the vicarage garden. Now all he had anticipated was come to pass. The vicar felt the satisfaction of the prophet who saw fire and brimstone consume the city which would not mend its way to his warning. Poor Philip was practically penniless, and what was the good of his mother's fine friends now? He heard that his father's extravagance was really criminal, and it was a mercy that Providence had seen fit to take his dear mother to itself. She had no more idea of money than a child." When Philip had been a week at Blackstable, an incident happened which seemed to irritate his uncle very much. One morning he found on the breakfast-table a small packet which had been sent on by post from the late Mrs. Carey's house in London. It was addressed to her. When the parson opened it he found a dozen photographs of Mrs. Carey. They showed the head and shoulders only, and her hair was more plainly done than usual, low on the forehead which gave her an unusual look. The face was thin and worn, but no illness could impair the beauty of her features. There was in the large dark eyes a sadness which Philip did not remember. The first sight of the dead woman gave Mr. Carey a little shock, but this was quickly followed by perplexity. The photographs seemed quite recent, and he could not imagine who had ordered them. "'Do you know anything about these, Philip?' he asked. "'I remember Mamma said she'd been taken,' he answered. "'Miss Watkins scolded her. She said, "'I wanted the boy to have something to remember me by when he grows up. 
Mr. Carey looked at Philip for an instant. The child spoke in a clear treble. He recalled the words, but they meant nothing to him. "'You'd better take one of the photographs and keep it in your room,' said Mr. Carey. "'I'll put the others away.' He sent one to Miss Watkin, and she wrote and explained how they came to be taken. One day Mrs. Carey was lying in bed, but she was feeling a little better than usual, and the doctor in the morning had seemed hopeful. Emma had taken the child out, and the maids were downstairs in the basement. Suddenly Mrs. Carey felt desperately alone in the world. A great fear seized her that she would not recover from the confinement which she was expecting in a fortnight. Her son was nine years old. How could he be expected to remember her? She could not bear to think that he would grow up and forget, forget her utterly and she had loved him so passionately because he was weakly and deformed, and because he was her child. She had no photographs of herself taken since her marriage, and that was ten years before. She wanted her son to know what she looked like at the end. He could not forget her then, not forget utterly. She knew that if she called her maid and told her she wanted to get up, the maid would prevent her, and perhaps send for the doctor and she had not the strength now to struggle or argue. She got out of bed and began to dress herself. She had been on her back so long that her legs gave way beneath her, and then the soles of her feet tingled so that she could hardly bear to put them to the ground. But she went on. She was unused to doing her own hair, and when she raised her arms and began to brush it she felt faint. She could never do it as her maid did. It was beautiful hair, very fine, and of a deep, rich gold. Her eyebrows were straight and dark. She put on a black skirt but chose the bodice of the evening dress which she liked best. It was of a white damask which was fashionable in those days. She looked at herself in the glass. Her face was very pale, but her skin was clear. She had never had much color, and this had always made the redness of her beautiful mouth emphatic she could not restrain a sob. But she could not afford to be sorry for herself. She was feeling already desperately tired, and she put on the furs which Henry had given her the Christmas before. She had been so proud of them and so happy then, and slipped downstairs with beating heart. She got safely out of the house and drove to a photographer. She paid for a dozen photographs. She was obliged to ask for a glass of water in the middle of the sitting, and the assistant, seeing she was ill, suggested that she come another day, but she insisted on staying till the end. At last it was finished, and she drove back again to the dingy little house in Kensington, which she hated with all her heart. It was a horrible house to die in. She found the front door open, and when she drove up the maid and Emma ran down the steps to help her. They had been frightened when they found her room empty. At first they thought she must have gone to Miss Watkin, and the cook was sent round. Miss Watkin came back with her and was waiting anxiously in the drawing-room. She came downstairs now full of anxiety and reproaches. But the exertion had been more than Mrs. Carey was fit for and when the occasion for firmness no longer existed, she gave way. She fell heavily into Emma's arms and was carried upstairs. She remained unconscious for a time that seemed incredibly long to those that watched her, and the doctor, hurriedly sent for, did not come. It was next day, when she was a little better, that Miss Watkin got some explanation out of her. Philip was playing on the floor of his mother's bedroom, and neither of the ladies paid attention to him. He only understood vaguely what they were talking about, and he could not have said why those words remained in his memory. "'I wanted the boy to have something to remember me by when he grows up. I can't make out why she ordered a dozen,' said Mr. Carey. Two would have done. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 one day was very like another at the vicarage. Soon after breakfast Mary Ann brought in the times. Mr. Carey shared it with two neighbors. He had it from ten till one, when the gardener took it over to Mr. Ellis at the Limes, with whom it remained till seven, 
Then it was taken to Miss Brooks at the manor house who, since she got it late, had the advantage of keeping it. In summer Mrs. Carey, when she was making jam, often asked for a copy to cover the pots with. When the vicar settled down to his paper his wife put on her bonnet and went out to do the shopping. Philip accompanied her. Blackstable was a fishing village. It consisted of a high street in which there were shops, the bank, the doctor's house, and the houses of two or three coal-ship owners. Round the little harbor were shabby streets in which lived fishermen and poor people. But since they went to chapel they were of no account. When Mrs. Carey passed the descending ministers in the street she stepped over to the other side to avoid meeting them, but if there was not time for this she fixed her eyes on the pavement. It was a scandal to which the vicar had never resigned himself that there were three chapels in the high street. He could not help feeling that the law should have stepped in to prevent their erection. Shopping in Blackstable was not a simple matter, for dissent helped by the fact that the parish church was two miles from town was very common, and it was necessary to deal only with churchgoers. Mrs. Carey knew perfectly that the vicarage custom might make all the difference to a tradesman's faith. There were two butchers who went to church, and they would not understand that the vicar could not deal with both of them at once, nor were they satisfied with this simple plan of going for six months to one and for six months to the other. The butcher who was not sending meat to the vicarage constantly threatened not to come to church and the vicar was sometimes obliged to make a threat. It was very wrong of him not to come to church, but if he carried iniquity further and actually went to chapel, then of course excellent as his meat was, Mrs. Carey would be forced to leave him forever. Mrs. Carey often stopped at the bank to deliver a message to Josiah Graves, the manager, who was choir-master, treasurer, and church-warden. He was a tall, thin man with a sallow face and a long nose. His hair was very white, and to Philip he seemed extremely old. He kept the parish accounts, arranged the treats for the choir and the schools. Though there was no organ in the parish church, it was generally considered, in Blackstable, that the choir he led was the best in Kent, and when there was any ceremony such as a visit from the bishop or confirmation or from the rural dean to preach at the harvest thanksgiving, he made the necessary preparations. But he had no hesitation in doing all manner of things without more than a perfunctory consultation with the vicar, and the vicar, though always ready to be saved trouble, much resented the churchwarden's managing ways. He really seemed to look upon himself as the most important person in the parish. Mr. Carey constantly told his wife that if Josiah Graves did not care he would give him a good rap over the knuckles one day, but Mrs. Carey advised him to bear with Josiah Graves. He meant well, and it was not his fault if he was not quite a gentleman. The vicar, finding his comfort in the practice of a Christian virtue, exercised forbearance, but he revenged himself by calling the churchwarden Bismarck behind his back. Once there had been a serious quarrel between the pair, and Mrs. Carey still thought of that anxious time with dismay. The conservative candidate had announced his intention of addressing a meeting at Blackstable, and Josiah Graves, having arranged that it should take place in the Mission Hall, went to Mr. Carey and told him that he hoped he would say a few words. It appeared that the candidate had asked Josiah Graves to take the chair. This was more than Mr. Carey could put up with. He had firm views upon the respect which was due to the cloth, and it was ridiculous for a churchwarden to take the chair at a meeting when the vicar was there. He reminded Josiah Graves that parson meant person, that is, the vicar was the person of the parish. Josiah Graves answered that he was the first to recognize the dignity of the church, but this was a matter of politics and in his turn he reminded the vicar that their blessed Saviour had enjoined upon them to render upon Caesar the things that were Caesar's. To this Mr. Carey replied that the devil could quote Scripture to his purpose, himself had sole authority over the mission hall, and if he were not asked to be chairman he would refuse the use of it for a political meeting. Josiah Graves told Mr. Carey that he might do as he chose, 
and for his part he thought the Wesleyan Chapel would be an equally suitable place. Then Mr. Carey said that if Josiah Graves set foot in what was little better than a heathen temple, he was not fit to be churchwarden in a Christian parish. Josiah Graves thereupon resigned all his offices, and that very evening sent to the church for his cassock and surplice. His sister, Miss Graves, who kept house for him, gave up her secretaryship of the maternity club, which provided the pregnant poor with flannel, baby linen, coals, and five shillings. Mr. Carey said he was at last master in his own house. But he soon found that he was obliged to see to all sorts of things that he knew nothing about, and Josiah Graves, after the first moment of irritation, discovered that he had lost his chief interest in life. Mrs. Carey and Miss Graves were much distressed by the quarrel. They met after a discreet exchange of letters, and made up their minds to put the matter right. They talked, one to her husband, the other to her brother, from morning till night. And since they were persuading these gentlemen to do what in their hearts they wanted, after three weeks of anxiety, a reconciliation was effected. It was to both their interest, but they ascribed it to a common love for their Redeemer. The meeting was held at the mission hall, and the doctor was asked to be chairman. Mr. Carey and Josiah Graves both made speeches. When Mrs. Carey had finished her business with the banker, she generally went upstairs to have a little chat with her sister, and while the ladies talked of parish matters, the curate or the new bonnet of Mrs. Wilson, Mr. Wilson was the richest man in Blackstable, he was thought to have at least five hundred a year, and he had married his cook. Philip sat demurely in the stiff parlor, used only to receive visitors, and busied himself with the restless movements of goldfish in a bowl. The windows were never opened except to air the room for a few minutes in the morning, and it had a stuffy smell which seemed to Philip to have a mysterious connection with banking. Then Mrs. Carey remembered that she had to go to the grocer, and they continued their way. When the shopping was done they often went down a side street of little houses, mostly of wood, in which fishermen dwelt, and here and there a fisherman sat on his doorstep mending his nets, and nets hung to dry upon the doors, till they came to a small beach shut in on each side by warehouses, but with a view of the sea. Mrs. Carey stood for a few minutes and looked at it. It was turbid and yellow, and who knows what thoughts passed through her mind, while Philip searched for flat stones to play ducks and drakes. Then they walked slowly back. They looked into the post office to get the right time, nodded to Mrs. Wigram, the doctor's wife, who sat at her window sewing, and so got home. Dinner was at one o'clock, and on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday it consisted of beef, roast, hashed, and minced, and on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of mutton. On Sunday they ate one of their own chickens. In the afternoon Philip did his lessons. He was taught Latin and mathematics by his uncle, who knew neither, and French and the piano by his aunt. Of French she was ignorant, but she knew the piano well enough to accompany the old-fashioned song she had sung for thirty years. Uncle William used to tell Philip that when he was a curate his wife had known twelve songs by heart, which she could sing at a moment's notice whenever she was asked. She often sang still when there was a tea-party at the vicarage. There were few people whom the Carries cared to ask there, and their parties consisted always of the curate, Josiah Grays with his sister, Dr. Wigram and his wife. After tea Miss Grays played one or two of Mendelssohn's songs without words, and Mrs. Carey sang When the Swallows Homeward Fly, or Trot Trot, My Pony. But the Careys did not give tea-parties often. The preparations upset them, and when their guests were gone they felt themselves exhausted. They preferred to have tea by themselves, and after tea they played backgammon. Mrs. Carey arranged that her husband should win because he did not like losing. They had cold supper at eight. It was a scrappy meal because Mary Ann resented getting anything ready after tea, and Mrs. Carey helped to clear away. Mrs. Carey seldom ate more than bread and butter with a little stewed fruit to follow, but the vicar had a slice of cold meat. 
Immediately after supper Mrs. Carey rang the bell for prayers, and then Philip went to bed. He rebelled against being undressed by Mary Ann, and after a while succeeded in establishing his right to dress and undress himself. At nine o'clock Mary Ann brought in the eggs and the plate. Mrs. Carey wrote the date on each egg and put the number down in a book. She then took the plate basket on her arm and went upstairs. Mr. Carey continued to read one of his old books, but as the clock struck ten he got up, put out the lamps, and followed his wife to bed. When Philip arrived there was some difficulty in deciding on which evening he should have his bath. It was never easy to get plenty of hot water since the kitchen boiler did not work, and it was impossible for two persons to have a bath on the same day. The only man who had a bathroom in Blackstable was Mr. Wilson, and it was thought ostentatious of him. Mary Ann had her bath in the kitchen on Monday night, because she liked to begin the week clean. Uncle William could not have his on Saturday, because he had a very heavy day before him, and he was always a little tired after a bath, so he had it on Friday. Mrs. Carey had hers on Thursday for the same reason. It looked as though Saturday were naturally indicated for Philip, but Mary Ann said she couldn't keep the fire up on Saturday night, what with all the cooking on Sunday, having to make pastry, and she didn't know what all, she did not feel up to giving the boy his bath on Saturday night, and it was quite clear that he could not bathe himself. Mrs. Carey was shy about bathing a boy, and of course the vicar had his sermon but the vicar insisted that Philip should be clean and sweet for the Lord's day. Mary Ann said she would rather go than be put upon, and after eighteen years she didn't expect to have more work given her, and they might show some consideration, and Philip said he didn't want anyone to bathe him, but could very well bathe himself. This settled it. Mary Ann said she was quite sure he wouldn't bathe himself properly, and rather than he should go dirty, and not because he was going into the presence of the Lord, but because she couldn't abide a boy who wasn't properly washed, she'd work herself to the bone, even if it was Saturday night. End of chapter 6 Recording by Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan Chapter 7 Sunday was a day crowded with incident. Mr. Carey was accustomed to say that he was the only man in his parish who worked seven days a week. The household got up half an hour earlier than usual. No lying abed for a poor parson on the day of rest, Mr. Carey remarked as Mary Ann knocked at the door punctually at eight. It took Mrs. Carey longer to dress, and she got down to breakfast at nine, a little breathless, only just before her husband. Mr. Carey's boots stood in front of the fire to warm. Prayers were longer than usual, and the breakfast more substantial. After breakfast the vicar cut thin slices of bread for the communion, and Philip was privileged to cut off the crust. He was sent to the study to fetch a marble paperweight with which Mr. Carey pressed the bread till it was thin and pulpy, and that it was cut into small squares. The amount was regulated by the weather. On a very bad day few people came to church, and on a very fine one, though many came, few stayed for communion. There were most when it was dry enough to make the walk to the church pleasant, but not so fine that people wanted to hurry away. Then Mrs. Carey brought the communion plate out of the safe which stood in the pantry, and the vicar polished it with a chamois leather. At ten the fly drove up, and Mr. Carey got into his boots. Mrs. Carey took several minutes to put on her bonnet, during which the vicar, in a voluminous cloak, stood in the hall with just such an expression on his face as would have become an early Christian about to be led into the arena. It was extraordinary that after thirty years of marriage his wife could not be ready in time on Sunday morning. At last she came in black satin. The vicar did not like colors in a clergyman's wife at any time but on Sundays he was determined that she should wear black. Now and then, in conspiracy with Miss Graves, she ventured a white feather or a pink rose in her bonnet, but the vicar insisted that it should disappear. He said he would not go to church with a scarlet woman. Mrs. Carey sighed as a woman, 
but obeyed as a wife. They were about to step into the carriage when the vicar remembered that no one had given him his egg. They knew that he must have an egg for his voice. There were two women in the house, and no one had the least regard for his comfort. Mrs. Carey scolded Mary Ann, and Mary Ann answered that she could not think of everything. She hurried away to fetch an egg, and Mrs. Carey beat it up in a glass of sherry. The vicar swallowed it at a gulp. The communion plate was stowed in the carriage, and they set off. The fly came from the Red Lion and had a peculiar smell of stale straw. They drove with both windows closed so that the vicar should not catch cold. The sexton was waiting at the porch to take the communion plate, and while the vicar went to the vestry Mrs. Carey and Philip settled themselves in the vicarage pew. Mrs. Carey placed in front of her the sixpenny bit she was accustomed to put in the plate and gave Philip threepence for the same purpose. The church filled up gradually, and the service began. Philip grew bored during the sermon, but if he fidgeted Mrs. Carey put a gentle hand on his arm and looked at him reproachfully. He regained interest when the final hymn was sung and Mr. Graves passed round with the plate. When everyone had gone Mrs. Carey went into Miss Graves' pew to have a few words with her while they were sitting for the gentleman and Philip went to the vestry. His uncle, the curate, and Mr. Grays were still in their surplices. Mr. Carey gave him the remains of the consecrated bread and told him he might eat it. He had been accustomed to eat it himself, as it seemed blasphemous to throw it away, but Philip's keen appetite relieved him from the duty. Then they counted the money. It consisted of pennies, sixpences, and threepenny bits. There were always two single shillings, one put in the plate by the vicar and the other by Mr. Graves, and sometimes there was a florin. Mr. Graves told the vicar who had given this. It was always a stranger to Blackstable, and Mr. Carey wondered who he was. But Miss Graves had observed the rash act and was able to tell Mrs. Carey that the stranger came from London, was married, and had children. During the drive home Mrs. Carey passed the information on, and the vicar made up his mind to call on him and ask for a subscription to the additional curate society. Mr. Carey asked if Philip had behaved properly, and Mrs. Carey remarked that Mrs. Wigram had a new mantle, Mr. Cox was not in church, and somebody thought that Miss Phillips was engaged. When they reached the vicarage they all felt that they deserved a substantial dinner. When this was over, Mrs. Carey went to her room to rest, and Mr. Carey lay down on the sofa in the drawing-room for forty winks. They had tea at five, and the vicar ate an egg to support himself for evensong. Mrs. Carey did not go to this so that Mary Ann might, but she read the service through and the hymns. Mr. Carey walked to church in the evening, and Philip limped along by his side. The walk through the darkness along the country road strangely impressed him and the church with all its lights in the distance coming gradually nearer seemed very friendly. At first he was shy with his uncle, but little by little grew used to him, and he would slip his hand in his uncle's and walk more easily for the feeling of protection. They had supper when they got home. Mr. Carey's slippers were waiting for him on a footstool in front of the fire, and by their side Phillips, one the shoe of a small boy, the other misshapen and odd. He was dreadfully tired when he went up to bed, and he did not resist when Mary Ann undressed him. She kissed him after she tucked him up, and he began to love her. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Philip had led always the solitary life of an only child, and his loneliness at the vicarage was no greater than it had been when his mother lived. He made friends with Mary Ann. She was a chubby little person of thirty-five the daughter of a fisherman, and had come to the vicarage at eighteen. It was her first place and she had no intention of leaving it, but she held a possible marriage as a rod over the timid heads of her master and mistress. Her father and mother lived in a little house off Harbor Street, and she went to see them on her evenings out. Her stories of the sea touched Philip's imagination, and the narrow alleys round the harbor grew rich with the romance which his young fancy lent them. One evening he asked whether he might go home with her, but his aunt was afraid that he might catch something. 
and his uncle said that evil communications corrupted good manners. He disliked the fisher folk who were rough, uncouth, and went to chapel. But Philip was more comfortable in the kitchen than in the dining room, and whenever he could he took his toys and played there. His aunt was not sorry. She did not like disorder, and though she recognized that boys must be expected to be untidy, she preferred that he should make a mess in the kitchen. If he fidgeted his uncle was apt to grow restless and say it was high time he went to school. Mrs. Carey thought Philip very young for this, and her heart went out to the motherless child, but her attempts to gain his affection were awkward, and the boy, feeling shy, received her demonstrations with so much sullenness that she was mortified. Sometimes she heard his shrill voice raised in laughter in the kitchen, but when she went in he grew suddenly silent and he flushed darkly when Mary Ann explained the joke. Mrs. Carey could not see anything amusing in what she heard, and she smiled with constraint. "'He seems happier with Mary Ann than with us, William,' she said when she returned to her sewing. "'One can see he's been very badly brought up. He wants licking into shape.' On the second Sunday after Philip arrived an unlucky incident occurred. Mr. Carey had retired as usual after dinner for a little snooze in the drawing-room, but he was in an irritable mood and could not sleep. Josiah Graves that morning had objected strongly to some candlesticks with which the vicar had adorned the altar. He had bought them second-hand in Turkenbury, and he thought they looked very well, but Josiah Graves said they were poppish. This was a taunt that always aroused the vicar. He had been at Oxford during the movement which ended in the secession from the established church of Edward Manning, and he felt a certain sympathy for the Church of Rome. He would willingly have made the service more ornate than had been usual in the low church parish of Blackstable, and in his secret soul he yearned for possessions and lighted candles. He drew the line at incense. He hated the word Protestant. He called himself a Catholic. He was accustomed to say that papists required an epithet. They were Roman Catholic, but the Church of England was Catholic in the best, the fullest, and the noblest sense of the term. He was pleased to think that his shaven face gave him the look of a priest, and in his youth he had possessed an aesthetic air which added to the impression. He often related that on one of his holidays in Boulogne, one of those holidays upon which his wife, for economy's sake, did not accompany him, when he was sitting in a church, the curé had come up to him and invited him to preach a sermon. He dismissed his curates when they married, having decided views on the celibacy of the unbeneficed clergy. But when at an election the liberals had written on his garden fence in large blue letters, This Way to Rome, he had been very angry and threatened to prosecute the leaders of the liberal party in Blackstable. He made up his mind now that nothing Josiah Graves said would induce him to remove the candlesticks from the altar, and he muttered Bismarck to himself once or twice irritably. Suddenly he heard an unexpected noise. He pulled the handkerchief off his face, got up from the sofa on which he was lying, and went into the dining-room. Philip was seated on the table with all his bricks around him. He had built a monstrous castle and some defect in the foundation had just brought the structure down in noisy ruin. "'What are you doing with those bricks, Philip? You know you're not allowed to play games on Sunday.' Philip stared at him for a moment with frightened eyes, and, as his habit was, flushed deeply. "'I always used to play at home,' he answered. "'I'm sure your dear mamma never allowed you to do such a wicked thing as that.' Philip did not know it was wicked, but, if it was, he did not wish it to be supposed that his mother had consented to it. He hung his head and did not answer. "'Don't you know it's very, very wicked to play on Sunday? What do you suppose it's called the day of rest for? You're going to church tonight, and how can you face your Maker when you've been breaking one of his laws in the afternoon?' Mr. Carey told him to put the bricks away at once, and stood over him while Philip did so. "'You're a very naughty boy,' he repeated. Think of the grief you're causing your poor mother in heaven. Philip felt inclined to cry, but he had an instinctive disinclination to letting other people see his tears, and he clenched his teeth to prevent the sobs from escaping. Mr. Carey sat down in his armchair and began to turn over the pages of a book. Philip stood at the window. 
The vicarage was set back from the high road to Turcanbury, and from the dining-room one saw a semicircular strip of lawn, and then as far as the horizon green fields. Sheep were grazing in them, the sky was forlorn and gray. Philip felt infinitely unhappy. Presently Mary Ann came in to lay the tea, and Aunt Louisa descended the stairs. "'Have you had a nice little nap, William?' she asked. "'No,' he answered. "'Philip made so much noise that I couldn't sleep a wink.' This was not quite accurate, for he had been kept awake by his own thoughts, and Philip, listening sullenly, reflected that he had only made a noise once, and there was no reason why his uncle should not have slept before or after. When Mrs. Carey asked for an explanation, the vicar narrated the facts. "'He hasn't even said he was sorry,' he finished. "'Oh, Philip, I'm sure you're sorry,' said Mrs. Carey, anxious that the child should not seem wickeder to his uncle than need be. Philip did not reply. He went on munching his bread and butter. He did not know what power it was in him that prevented him from making any expression of regret. He felt his ears tingling, he was a little inclined to cry, but no word would issue from his lips. "'You needn't make it worse by sulking,' said Mr. Carey. Tea was finished in silence. Mr. Carey looked at Philip surreptitiously now and then, but the vicar elaborately ignored him. When Philip saw his uncle go upstairs to get ready for church, he went into the hall and got his hat and coat, but when the vicar came downstairs and saw him he said, "'I don't wish you to go to church tonight, Philip. I don't think you're in a proper frame of mind to enter the house of God.' Philip did not say a word. He felt it was a deep humiliation that was placed upon him, and his cheeks reddened. He stood silently, watching his uncle put on his broad hat and his voluminous cloak. Mrs. Carey, as usual, went to the door to see him off. Then she turned to Philip. "'Never mind, Philip. You won't be a naughty boy next Sunday, will you? And then your uncle will take you to church with him in the evening.' She took off his coat and hat and led him into the dining-room. "'Shall you and I read the service together, Philip, and we'll sing the hymns at the harmonium? Would you like that?' Philip shook his head decidedly. Mrs. Carey was taken aback. If he would not read the evening service with her, she did not know what to do with him. "'Then what would you like to do until your uncle comes back?' she asked helplessly. Philip broke his silence at last. "'I want to be left alone,' he said. "'Philip, how can you say anything so unkind? Don't you know that your uncle and I only want your good? Don't you love me at all? I hate you. I wish you was dead.' Mrs. Carey gasped. He said the words so savagely that it gave her quite a start. She had nothing to say. She sat down in her husband's chair, and as she thought of her desire to love the friendless crippled boy, and her eager wish that he should love her, she was a barren woman, and even though it was clearly God's will that she should be childless, she could scarcely bear to look at little children sometimes, her heart ached so. The tears rose to her eyes, and one by one slowly rolled down her cheeks. Philip watched in amazement. She took out her handkerchief and now she cried without restraint. Suddenly Philip realized that she was crying because of what he had said, and he was sorry. He went up to her silently and kissed her. It was the first kiss he had ever given her without being asked. And the poor lady, so small in her black satin, shriveled up and sallow, with her funny corkscrew curls, took the little boy on her lap and put her arms around him and wept as though her heart would break but her tears were partly tears of happiness, for she felt that the strangeness between them was gone. She loved him now with a new love, because he had made her suffer. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 On the following Sunday, when the vicar was making his preparations to go into the drawing-room for his nap, all the actions of his life were conducted with ceremony, and Mrs. Carey was about to go upstairs, Philip asked, "'What shall I do if I'm not allowed to play?' "'Can't you sit still for once and be quiet?' "'I can't sit still till tea-time.' Mr. Carey looked out the window, but it was cold and raw, and he could not suggest that Philip should go out into the garden. "'I know what you can do. You can learn by heart the collect for the day.' 
He took the prayer book which was used for prayers from the harmonium and turned the pages till he came to the place he wanted. It's not a long one. If you can say it without a mistake when I come in to tea, you shall have the top of my egg. Mrs. Carey drew up Philip's chair to the dining-room table. They had bought him a high chair by now and placed the book in front of him. The devil finds work for idle hands to do, said Mr. Carey. He put some more coals on the fire so that there should be a cheerful blaze when he came in to tea and went into the drawing-room. He loosened his collar, arranged the cushions, and settled himself comfortably on the sofa. But thinking the drawing-room a little chilly, Mrs. Carey brought him a rug from the hall. She put it over his legs and tucked it round his feet. She drew the blind so that the light should not offend his eyes, and since he had closed them already went out of the room on tiptoe. The vicar was at peace with himself to-day, and in ten minutes he was asleep. He snored softly. It was the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, and the collect began with the words, O God, whose blessed Son was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, and make us the sons of God and heirs of eternal life. Philip read it through. He could make no sense of it. He began saying the words aloud to himself, but many of them were unknown to him, and the construction of the sentence was strange. He could not get more than two lines in his head, and his attention was constantly wandering. There were fruit trees trained on the walls of the vicarage, and a long twig beat now and then against the window pane. Sheep grazed stolidly in the field beyond the garden. It seemed as though there were knots inside his brain. Then panic seized him that he would not know the words by tea-time, and he kept on whispering them to himself quickly. He did not try to understand, but merely to get them parrot-like into his memory. Mrs. Carey could not sleep that afternoon, and by four o'clock she was so wide awake that she came downstairs. She thought she would hear Philip his colic so that he should make no mistakes when he said it to his uncle. His uncle then would be pleased. He would see that the boy's heart was in the right place. But when Mrs. Carey came to the dining-room and was about to go in, she heard a sound that made her stop suddenly. Her heart gave a little jump. She turned away and quietly slipped out of the front door. She walked round the house till she came to the dining-room window, and then cautiously looked in. Philip was still sitting on the chair she had put him in but his head was on the table, buried in his arms, and he was sobbing desperately. She saw the convulsive movement of his shoulders. Mrs. Carey was frightened. A thing that had always struck her about the child was that he seemed so collected. She had never seen him cry, and now she realized that his calmness was some instinctive shame of showing his feelings. He hid himself to weep. Without thinking that her husband disliked being wakened suddenly, she burst into the drawing-room. "'William, William,' she said, "'the boy's crying as though his heart will break.' Mr. Carey sat up and disentangled himself from the rug about his legs. "'What's he got to cry about?' "'I don't know. Oh, William, we can't let the boy be unhappy. Do you think it's our fault? If we'd had children we'd have known what to do.' Mr. Carey looked at her in perplexity. He felt extraordinarily helpless. He can't be crying because I gave him the colic to learn. It's not more than ten lines. Don't you think I might take him some picture books to look at, William? There are some of the Holy Land. There couldn't be anything wrong in that. Very well. I don't mind. Mrs. Carey went into the study. To collect books was Mr. Carey's only passion, and he never went into Turcanbury without spending an hour or two in the second-hand shop. He always brought back four or five musty volumes. He never read them, for he had long lost the habit of reading, but he liked to turn the pages, look at the illustrations if they were illustrated, and mend the bindings. He welcomed wet days because on them he could stay at home without pangs of conscience and spend the afternoon with white of egg and a glue pot, patching up the Russia leather of some battered quarto. He had many volumes of old travels with steel engravings, and Mrs. Carey quickly found two which described Palestine. She coughed elaborately at the door so that Philip should have time to compose himself. She felt that he would be humiliated if she came upon him in the midst of his tears. Then she rattled the door-handle. When she went in, Philip was poring over the prayer-book, 
hiding his eyes with his hands so that she might not see he had been crying. "'Do you know the collect yet?' she said. He did not answer for a moment, and she felt that he did not trust his voice. She was oddly embarrassed. "'I can't learn it by heart,' he said at last with a gasp. "'Oh, well, never mind,' she said. "'You needn't. I've got some picture books for you to look at. Come and sit on my lap and we'll look at them together.' Philip slipped off his chair and limped over to her. He looked down so that she should not see his eyes. She put her arms round him. "'Look,' she said, "'that's the place where our blessed Lord was born.' She showed him an eastern town with flat roofs and cupolas and minarets. In the foreground was a group of palm trees, and under them were resting two Arabs and some camels. Philip passed his hands over the picture as if he wanted to feel the houses and the loose habiliments of the nomads. "'Read what it says,' he asked. Mrs. Carey, in her even voice, read the opposite page. It was a romantic narrative of some eastern traveller of the thirties, pompous maybe, but fragrant with the emotion with which the East came to the generation that followed Byron and Chateaubriand. In a moment or two Philip interrupted her. "'I want to see another picture.' When Mary Ann came in and Mrs. Carey rose to help her lay the cloth, Philip took the book in his hands and hurried through the illustrations. It was with difficulty that his aunt induced him to put the book down for tea. He had forgotten his horrible struggle to get the collect by heart. He had forgotten his tears. Next day it was raining, and he asked for the book again. Mrs. Carey gave it to him joyfully. Talking over his future with her husband, she had found that both desired him to take orders, and this eagerness for the book which described places hallowed by the presence of Jesus seemed a good sign. It looked as though the boy's mind addressed itself naturally to holy things, but in a day or two he asked for more books. Mr. Carey took him into his study, showed him the shelf in which he kept illustrated works, and chose for him one that dealt with Rome. Philip took it greedily. The pictures led him to a new amusement. He began to read the page before and the page after each engraving to find out what it was about, and soon he lost all interest in his toys. Then, when no one was near, he took out books for himself, and perhaps because the first impression on his mind was made by an eastern town he found his chief amusement in those which described the Levant. His heart beat with the excitement at the pictures of mosques and rich palaces, but there was one in a book on Constantinople which peculiarly stirred his imagination. It was called The Hall of the Thousand Columns. It was a Byzantine cistern which the popular fancy had endowed with fantastic vastness, and the legend which he read told that a boat was always moored at the entrance to tempt the unwary, but no traveller venturing into the darkness had ever been seen again. And Philip wondered whether the boat went on for ever through one pillared alley after another, or came at last to some strange mansion. One day a good fortune befell him, for he hit upon Lane's translation of The Thousand Nights and a Night. He was captured first by the illustrations, and then he began to read, to start with, the stories that dealt with magic, and then the others and those he liked he read again and again. He could think of nothing else. He forgot the life about him. He had to be called two or three times before he would come to his dinner. Insensibly he formed the most delightful habit in the world, the habit of reading. He did not know that thus he was providing himself with a refuge from all the distress of life. He did not know either that he was creating for himself an unreal world which would make the real world of every day a source of bitter disappointment. Presently he began to read other things. His brain was precocious. His aunt and uncle, seeing that he occupied himself and neither worried nor made a sound, ceased to trouble themselves about him. Mr. Carey had so many books that he did not know them, and as he read little he forgot the odd lots he had bought at one time and another because they were cheap. Haphazard among the sermons and homilies, the travels, the lives of the saints, the fathers, the histories of the church, were old-fashioned novels, and these Philip at last discovered. He chose them by their titles, and the first he read was The Lancashire Witches, 
and then he read the admirable Crichton, and then many more. Whenever he started a book with two solitary travelers riding along the brink of a desperate ravine, he knew he was safe. The summer was come now, and the gardener and old sailor made him a hammock and fixed it up for him the branches of a weeping willow, and here for long hours he lay, hidden from anyone who might come to the vicarage, reading, reading passionately. Time passed, and it was July. August came. On Sundays the church was crowded with strangers, and the collection at the operatory often amounted to two pounds. Neither the vicar nor Mrs. Carey went out of the garden much during this period, for they disliked strange faces, and they looked upon the visitors from London with aversion. The house opposite was taken for six weeks by a gentleman who had two little boys, and he sent in to ask if Philip would like to go and play with them. But Mrs. Carey returned a polite refusal. She was afraid that Philip would be corrupted by little boys from London. He was going to be a clergyman, and it was necessary that he should be preserved from contamination. She liked to see in him an infant Samuel. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Careys made up their mind to send Philip to King's School at Turcanbury. The neighboring clergy sent their sons there. It was united by long tradition to the cathedral. Its headmaster was an honorary canon, and a past headmaster was the archdeacon. Boys were encouraged there to aspire to holy orders, and the education was such as might prepare an honest lad to spend his life in God's service. A preparatory school was attached to it, and to this it was arranged that Philip should go. Mr. Carey took him into Turcanbury one Thursday afternoon towards the end of September. All day Philip had been excited and rather frightened. He knew little of school life but what he had read in the stories of the boy's own paper. He had also read Eric, or Little by Little. When they got out of the train at Turcanbury Philip felt sick with apprehension, and during the drive into the town sat pale and silent. The high brick wall in front of the school gave it the look of a prison. There was a little door in it which opened on their ringing, and a clumsy, untidy man came out and fetched Philip's tin trunk and his play-box. They were shown into the drawing-room. It was filled with massive, ugly furniture, and the chairs of the suite were placed round the walls with a forbidding rigidity. They waited for the headmaster. "'What's Mr. Watson like?' asked Philip after a while. "'You'll see for yourself.' There was another pause. Mr. Carey wondered why the headmaster did not come. Presently Philip made an effort and spoke again. "'Tell him I've got a club foot,' he said. Before Mr. Carey could speak the door burst open and Mr. Watson swept into the room. To Philip he seemed gigantic. He was a man of over six feet high and broad with enormous hands and a great red beard. He talked loudly in a jovial manner but his aggressive cheerfulness struck terror in Philip's heart. He shook hands with Mr. Carey, and then took Philip's small hand in his. "'Well, young fellow, are you glad to come to school?' he shouted. Philip reddened and found no word to answer. "'How old are you?' Nine, said Philip. "'You must say, sir,' said his uncle. "'I expect you've got a good lot to learn,' the headmaster bellowed cheerily. To give the boy confidence he began to tickle him with rough fingers. Philip, feeling shy and uncomfortable, squirmed under his touch. "'I put him in the small dormitory for the present. You'll like that, won't you?' he added to Philip. "'Only eight of you in there. You won't feel so strange.' Then the door opened and Mrs. Watson came in. She was a dark woman with black hair, neatly parted in the middle. She had curiously thick lips and a small round nose. Her eyes were large and black. There was a singular coldness in her appearance. She seldom spoke and smiled more seldom still. Her husband introduced Mr. Carey to her, and then gave Philip a friendly push towards her. "'This is a new boy, Helen. His name's Carey.' Without a word she shook hands with Philip, and then sat down, not speaking, while the headmaster asked Mr. Carey how much Philip knew and what books he had been working with. The vicar of Blackstable was a little embarrassed by Mr. Watson's boisterous heartiness, and in a moment or two got up. "'I think I'd better leave Philip with you now.' "'That's all right,' said Mr. Watson. "'He'll be safe with me. 
he'll get on like a house on fire, won't you, young fellow? Without waiting for an answer from Philip, the big man burst into a great bellow of laughter. Mr. Carey kissed Philip on the forehead and went away. "'Come along, young fellow,' shouted Mr. Watson. "'I'll show you the schoolroom.' He swept out of the drawing-room with giant strides, and Philip hurriedly limped along behind him. He was taken into a long bare room with two tables that ran along its whole length. On each side of them were wooden forms. "'Nobody much here yet,' said Mr. Watson. "'I'll just show you the playground, and then I'll leave you to shift for yourself.' Mr. Watson led the way. Philip found himself in a large playground with high brick walls on three sides of it. On the fourth side was an iron railing through which you saw a vast lawn, and beyond this some of the buildings of King's School. One small boy was wandering disconsolately, kicking up the gravel as he walked. "'Hello, Venning!' shouted Mr. Watson. "'When did you turn up?' The small boy came forward and shook hands. "'Here's a new boy. He's older and bigger than you, so don't you bully him.' The headmaster glared amicably at the two children, filling them with fear by the roar of his voice, and then, with a guffaw, left them. "'What's your name?' "'Carrie.' "'What's your father?' "'He's dead.' "'Oh. Does your mother wash?' "'My mother's dead, too.' Philip thought this answer would cause the boy a certain awkwardness, but Venning was not to be turned from his facetiousness for so little. "'Well, did she wash?' he went on. Yes, said Philip indignantly. She was a washerwoman then. No, she wasn't. Then she didn't wash. The little boy crowed with delight at the success of his dialectic. Then he caught sight of Philip's feet. What's the matter with your foot? Philip instinctively tried to withdraw it from sight. He hid it behind the one which was whole. I've got a club foot, he answered. How did you get it? I've always had it. Let's have a look. No. Don't then. The little boy accompanied the words with a sharp kick on Philip's shin, which Philip did not expect, and thus could not guard against. The pain was so great that it made him gasp, but greater than the pain was the surprise. He did not know why Venning kicked him. He had not the presence of mind to give him a black eye. Besides, the boy was smaller than he, and he had read in the boy's own paper that it was a mean thing to hit anyone smaller than yourself. While Philip was nursing his shin, a third boy appeared, and his tormentor left him. In a little while he noticed that the pair were talking about him, and he felt they were looking at his feet. He grew hot and uncomfortable. But others arrived, a dozen together, and then more, and they began to talk about their doings during the holidays, where they had been, and what wonderful cricket they had played. A few new boys appeared, and with these presently Philip found himself talking. He was shy and nervous. He was anxious to make himself pleasant, but he could not think of anything to say. He was asked a great many questions and answered them all quite willingly. One boy asked him whether he could play cricket. No, answered Philip, I've got a club foot. The boy looked down quickly and reddened. Philip saw that he felt he had asked an unseemly question. He was too shy to apologize and looked at Philip awkwardly. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Next morning, when the clanging of a bell awoke Philip, he looked round his cubicle in astonishment. Then a voice sang out, and he remembered where he was. "'Are you awake, singer?' The partitions of the cubicle were of polished pitch pine, and there was a great curtain in front. In those days there was little thought of ventilation, and the windows were closed except when the dormitory was aired in the morning. Philip got up and knelt down to say his prayers. It was a cold morning and he shivered a little, but he had been taught by his uncle that his prayers were more acceptable to God if he said them in his nightshirt than if he waited till he was dressed. This did not surprise him, for he was beginning to realize that he was the creature of a God who appreciated the discomfort of his worshippers. Then he washed. There were two baths for the fifty boarders, and each boy had a bath once a week. The rest of the washing was done in a small basin on a washstand, which with the bed and the chair made up the furniture of each cubicle. The boys chatted gaily while they dressed. Philip was all ears. Then another bell sounded and they ran downstairs. They took their seats on the forms on each side of the two long tables in the schoolroom. 
and Mr. Watson, followed by his wife and the servants, came in and sat down. Mr. Watson read prayers in an impressive manner, and the supplications thundered out in his loud voice as though they were threats personally addressed to each boy. Philip listened with anxiety. Then Mr. Watson read a chapter from the Bible, and the servants trooped out. In a moment the untidy youth brought in two large pots of tea, and on a second journey immense dishes of bread and butter. Philip had a squeamish appetite, and the thick slabs of poor butter on the bread turned his stomach, but he saw other boys scraping it off and followed their example. They all had potted meats and such like, which they had brought in their play boxes, and some had extras, eggs or bacon, upon which Mr. Watson made a profit. When he had asked Mr. Carey whether Philip was to have these, Mr. Carey replied that he did not think boys should be spoiled. Mr. Watson quite agreed with him. He considered nothing was better than bread and butter for growing lads, but some parents unduly pampering their offspring insisted on it. Philip noticed that extras gave boys a certain consideration and made up his mind when he wrote to Aunt Louisa to ask for them. After breakfast the boys wandered out into the playground. Here the day boys were gradually assembling. They were sons of the local clergy, of the officers at the depot, and of such manufacturers or men of business as the old town possessed. Presently a bell rang, and they all trooped into school. This consisted of a large, long room at opposite ends of which two undermasters conducted the second and third forms, and of a smaller one leading out of it, used by Mr. Watson, who taught the first form. To attach the preparatory to the senior school, these three classes were known officially, on speech days and in reports, as upper, middle, and lower second. Philip was put in the last. The master, a red-faced man with a pleasant voice, was called Rice. He had a jolly manner with boys, and the time passed quickly. Philip was surprised when it was a quarter to eleven, and they were let out for ten minutes' rest. The whole school rushed noisily into the playground. The new boys were told to go into the middle, while the others stationed themselves along opposite walls. They began to play pig in the middle. The old boys ran from wall to wall, while the new boys tried to catch them. When one was seized and the mystic words said, One, two, three, and a pig for me, he became a prisoner, and turning sides helped to catch those who were still free. Philip saw a boy running past and tried to catch him, but his limp gave him no chance, and the runners taking their opportunity made straight for the ground he covered. Then one of them had the brilliant idea of imitating Philip's clumsy run. Other boys saw it and began to laugh. Then they all copied the first, and they ran round Philip, limping grotesquely, screaming in their treble voices with shrill laughter. They lost their heads with the delight of their new amusement and choked with helpless merriment. One of them tripped Philip up and he fell, heavily as he always fell, and cut his knee. They laughed all the louder when he got up. A boy pushed him from behind, and he would have fallen again if another had not caught him. The game was forgotten in the entertainment of Philip's deformity. One of them invented an odd rolling limp that struck the rest as supremely ridiculous, and several of the boys lay down on the ground and rolled about in laughter. Philip was completely scared. He could not make out why they were laughing at him. His heart beat so that he could hardly breathe, and he was more frightened than he had ever been in his life. He stood still stupidly while the boys ran round him, mimicking and laughing. They shouted to him to try and catch them, but he did not move. He did not want them to see him run any more. He was using all his strength to prevent himself from crying. Suddenly the bell rang, and they all trooped back to school. Philip's knee was bleeding, and he was dusty and disheveled. For some minutes Mr. Rice could not control his form. They were excited still by the strange novelty, and Philip saw one or two of them furtively looking down at his feet. He tucked them under the bench. In the afternoon they went up to play football, but Mr. Watson stopped Philip on the way out after dinner. "'I suppose you can't play football, Carrie?' he asked him. Philip blushed self-consciously. "'No, sir.' "'Very well. You'd better go up to the field. You can walk as far as that, can't you?' 
Philip had no idea where the field was, but he answered all the same. Yes, sir. The boys went in charge of Mr. Rice, who glanced at Philip, and seeing he had not changed, asked why he was not going to play. Mr. Watson said, I needn't, sir, said Philip. Why? There were boys all round him, looking at him curiously, and a feeling of shame came over Philip. He looked down without answering. Others gave the reply. He's got a club foot, sir. Oh, I see. Mr. Rice was quite young. He had only taken his degree a year before, and he was suddenly embarrassed. His instinct was to beg the boy's pardon, but he was too shy to do so. He made his voice gruff and loud. Now then, you boys, what are you waiting about for? Get on with you. Some of them had already started, and those that were left now set off in groups of two or three. You'd better come along with me, Carrie, said the master. You don't know the way, do you? Philip guessed the kindness, and a sob came to his throat. I can't go very fast, sir. Then I'll go very slow, said the master with a smile. Philip's heart went out to the red-faced, commonplace young man who said a gentle word to him. He suddenly felt less unhappy. But at night, when they went up to bed and were undressing, the boy who was called Singer came out of his cubicle and put his head in Philip's. I say, let's look at your foot, he said. No, answered Philip. He jumped into bed quickly. Don't say no to me, said Singer. Come on, Mason. The boy in the next cubicle was looking round the corner, and at the words he slipped in. They made for Philip and tried to tear the bedclothes off him, but he held them tightly. Why can't you leave me alone? he cried. Singer seized a brush and with the back of it beat Philip's hands clenched on the blanket. Philip cried out, Why don't you show us your foot quietly? I won't. In desperation Philip clenched his fist and hit the boy who tormented him, but he was at a disadvantage and the boy seized his arm. He began to turn it. Oh, don't, don't, said Philip, you'll break my arm. Stop still then and put out your foot. Philip gave a sob and a gasp. The boy gave the arm another wrench. The pain was unendurable. All right, I'll do it, said Philip. He put out his foot. Singer still kept his hand on Philip's wrist. He looked curiously at the deformity. Isn't it beastly, said Mason. Another came in and looked too. Ugh, he said in disgust. My word, it is rum, said Singer, making a face. Is it hard? He touched it with the tip of his forefinger, cautiously, as though it were something that had a life of its own. Suddenly they heard Mr. Watson's heavy tread on the stairs. They threw the clothes back on Philip and dashed like rabbits into their cubicles. Mr. Watson came into the dormitory. Raising himself on tiptoe, he could see over the rod that bore the green curtain, and he looked into two or three of the cubicles. The little boys were safely in bed. He put out the light and went out. Singer called out to Philip, but he did not answer. He had got his teeth in the pillow so that his sobbing should be inaudible. He was not crying for the pain they had caused him, nor for the humiliation he had suffered when they looked at his foot, but with rage at himself because, unable to stand the torture, he had put out his foot of his own accord. And then he felt the misery of his life. It seemed to his childish mind that this unhappiness must go on forever. For no particular reason he remembered that cold morning when Emma had taken him out of bed and put him beside his mother. He had not thought of it once since it happened, but now he seemed to feel the warmth of his mother's body against his and her arms around him. Suddenly it seemed to him that his life was a dream, his mother's death and the life at the vicarage, and these two wretched days at school, and he would awake in the morning and be back again at home. His tears dried as he thought of it. He was too unhappy. It must be nothing but a dream, and his mother was alive, and Emma would come up presently and go to bed. He fell asleep, but when he awoke next morning it was to the clanging of a bell, and the first thing his eyes saw was the green curtain of his cubicle. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 As time went on, Philip's deformity ceased to interest. It was accepted like one boy's red hair and another's unreasonable corpulence. But meanwhile he had grown horribly sensitive. 
He never ran if he could help it, because he knew it made his limp more conspicuous, and he adopted a peculiar walk. He stood still as much as he could with his club foot behind the other, so that it should not attract notice, and he was constantly on the lookout for any reference to it. Because he could not join in the games which other boys played, their life remained strange to him. He only interested himself from the outside in their doings, and it seemed to him that there was a barrier between them and him. Sometimes they seemed to think that it was his fault if he could not play football, and he was unable to make them understand. He was left a good deal to himself. He had been inclined to talkativeness, but gradually he became silent. He began to think of the difference between himself and others. The biggest boy in his dormitory, Singer, took a dislike to him, and Philip, small for his age, had to put up with a good deal of hard treatment. About halfway through the term a mania ran through the school for a game called Nibs. It was a game for two, played on a table or a form with steel pegs. You had to push your nib with the fingernail so as to get the point of it over your opponent's, while he maneuvered to prevent this and to get the point of his nib over the back of yours. When this result was achieved, you breathed on the ball of your thumb, pressed it hard on the two nibs, and if you were able then to lift them without dropping either, both nibs became yours. Soon nothing was seen but boys playing this game, and the more skillful acquired vast stores of nibs. But in a little while Mr. Watson made up his mind that it was a form of gambling, forbade the game, and confiscated all the nibs in the boy's possession. Philip had been very adroit, and it was with a heavy heart that he gave up his winning, but his fingers itched to play still, and a few days later on his way to the football field he went into a shop and bought a pennyworth of J-pens. He carried them loose in his pocket and enjoyed feeling them. Presently Singer found out that he had them. Singer had given up his nibs, too, but he had kept back a very large one called a jumbo, which was almost unconquerable, and he could not resist the opportunity of getting Philip's J's out of him. Though Philip knew that he was at a disadvantage with his small nibs, he had an adventurous disposition and was willing to take the risk. Besides, he was aware that Singer would not allow him to refuse. He had not played for a week and sat down to the game now with a thrill of excitement. He had lost two of his small nibs quickly and Singer was jubilant, but the third time, by some chance, the jumbo slipped round and Philip was able to push his J across it. He crowed with triumph. At that moment Mr. Watson came in. "'What are you doing?' he asked. He looked from Singer to Philip, but neither answered. "'Don't you know that I've forbidden you to play that idiotic game?' Philip's heart beat fast. He knew what was coming and was dreadfully frightened, but in his fright there was a certain exultation. He had never been swished. Of course it would hurt, but it was something to boast about afterwards. Come into my study. The headmaster turned and they followed him side by side. Singer whispered to Philip, We're in for it. Mr. Watson pointed to Singer. Bend over, he said. Philip, very white, saw the boy quiver at each stroke, and after the third he heard him cry out. Three more followed. That'll do. Get up. Singer stood up. The tears were streaming down his face. Philip stepped forward. Mr. Watson looked at him for a moment. I'm not going to cane you. You're a new boy, and I can't hit a cripple. Go away, both of you, and don't be naughty again. When they got back into the schoolroom a group of boys who had learned in some mysterious way what was happening were waiting for them. They set upon Singer at once with eager questions. Singer faced them, his face red with the pain and marks of tears still on his cheeks. He pointed with his head at Philip, who was standing a little behind him. He got off because he's a cripple, he said angrily. Philip stood silent and flushed. He felt that they looked at him with contempt. How many did you get? one boy asked Singer. But he did not answer. He was angry because he had been hurt. Don't ask me to play nibs with you again, he said to Philip. It's jolly nice for you. You don't risk anything. I didn't ask you. Didn't you? He quickly put out his foot and tripped Philip up. Philip was always rather unsteady on his feet, and he fell heavily to the ground. Cripple, said Singer. 
For the rest of the term he tormented Philip cruelly, and, though Philip tried to keep out of his way, the school was so small that it was impossible. He tried being friendly and jolly with him. He abased himself so far as to buy him a knife, but though Singer took the knife he was not placated. Once or twice, driven beyond endurance, he hit and kicked the bigger boy, but Singer was so much stronger that Philip was helpless, and he was always forced after more or less torture to beg his pardon. It was that which rankled with Philip. He could not bear the humiliation of apologies which were wrung from him by pain greater than he could bear, and what made it worse was that there seemed no end to his wretchedness. Singer was only eleven and would not go to the upper school till he was thirteen. Philip realized that he must live two years with a tormentor from whom there was no escape. He was only happy while he was working and when he got into bed, and often there recurred to him then that queer feeling that his life with all its misery was nothing but a dream, and that he would awake in the morning in his own little bed in London. End of chapter 12 Recording by Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham Chapter 13 Two years passed and Philip was nearly twelve. He was in the first form within two or three places of the top, and after Christmas when several boys would be leaving for the senior school he would be head boy. He had already quite a collection of prizes, worthless books on bad paper, but in gorgeous bindings decorated with the arms of the school. His position had freed him from bullying, and he was not unhappy. His fellows forgave him his success because of his deformity. After all, it's jolly easy for him to get prizes, they said. There's nothing he can do but swat. He had lost his early terror of Mr. Watson. He had grown used to the loud voice, and when the headmaster's heavy hand was laid on his shoulder, Philip discerned vaguely the intention of a caress. He had the good memory which is more useful for scholastic achievements than mental power, and he knew Mr. Watson expected him to leave the preparatory school with a scholarship. But he had grown very self-conscious. The newborn child does not realize that his body is more a part of himself than surrounding objects, and will play with his toes without any feeling that they belong to him more than the rattle by his side, and it is only by degrees through pain that he understands the fact of the body. And experiences of the same kind are necessary for the individual to become conscious of himself. But here there is the difference that, although everyone becomes equally conscious of his body as a separate and complete organism, everyone does not become equally conscious of himself as a complete and separate personality. The feeling of apartness from others comes to most with puberty, but it is not always developed to such a degree as to make the difference between the individual and his fellows noticeable to the individual. It is such as he, as little conscious of himself as the bee in a hive, who are the lucky in life, for they have the best chance of happiness. Their activities are shared by all and their pleasures are only pleasures because they are enjoyed in common. You will see them on Whit Monday dancing on Hampstead Heath, shouting at a football match, or from club windows in Pall Mall cheering a royal procession. It is because of them that man has been called a social animal. Philip passed from the innocence of childhood to bitter consciousness of himself by the ridicule which his club foot had excited. The circumstances of his case were so peculiar that he could not apply to them the ready-made rules which acted well enough in ordinary affairs, and he was forced to think for himself. The many books he had read filled his mind with ideas which, because he only half understood them, gave more scope to his imagination. Beneath his painful shyness something was growing up within him, and obscurely he realized his personality but at times it gave him odd surprises. He did things he knew not why, and afterwards when he thought of them found himself all at sea. There was a boy named Luard between whom and Philip a friendship had arisen, and one day when they were playing together in the schoolroom Luard began to perform some trick with an ebony penholder of Philip's. 
"'Don't play the giddy ox,' said Philip. "'You'll only break it. I shan't.' But no sooner were the words out of the boy's mouth than the penholder snapped in two. Luard looked at Philip with dismay. "'Oh, I say, I'm awfully sorry.' The tears rolled down Philip's cheeks, but he did not answer. "'I say, what's the matter?' said Luard with surprise. "'I'll get you another one exactly the same.' "'It's not about the penholder I care,' said Philip in a trembling voice. "'Only it was given me by my mater just before she died.' "'I say, I'm awfully sorry, Carrie. "'It doesn't matter. It wasn't your fault.' Philip took the two pieces of the penholder and looked at them. He tried to restrain his sobs. He felt utterly miserable. And yet he could not tell why, for he knew quite well that he had bought the penholder during his last holidays at Blackstable, for one and twopence. He did not know in the least what had made him invent that pathetic story but he was quite as unhappy as though it had been true. The pious atmosphere of the vicarage and the religious tone of the school had made Philip's conscience very sensitive. He absorbed insensibly the feeling about him that the tempter was ever on the watch to gain his immortal soul, and though he was not more truthful than most boys he never told a lie without suffering from remorse. When he thought over this incident he was very much distressed and made up his mind that he must go to Luard and tell him that the story was an invention. Though he dreaded humiliation more than anything in the world, he hugged himself for two or three days at the thought of the agonizing joy of humiliating himself to the glory of God. But he never got any further. He satisfied his conscience by the more comfortable method of expressing his repentance only to the Almighty but he could not understand why he should have been so genuinely affected by the story he was making up. The tears that flowed down his grubby cheeks were real tears. Then by some accident of association there occurred to him that scene when Emma had told him of his mother's death, and though he could not speak for crying he had insisted on going in to say good-bye to the Mrs. Watkins so that they might see his grief and pity him. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Then a wave of religiosity passed through the school. Bad language was no longer heard, and the little nastiness of small boys were looked upon with hostility. The bigger boys, like the lords temporal of the Middle Ages, used the strength of their arms to persuade those weaker than themselves to virtuous courses. Philip, his restless mind avid for new things, became very devout. He heard soon that it was possible to join a Bible League, and wrote to London for particulars. These consisted in a form to be filled up with the applicant's name, age, and school, a solemn declaration to be signed that he would read a set portion of Holy Scripture every night for a year, and a request for half a crown. This, it was explained, was demanded partly to prove the earnestness of the applicant's desire to become a member of the League, and partly to cover clerical expenses. Philip duly sent the papers and the money, and in return received a calendar worth about a penny, on which was set down the appointed passage to be read each day, and a sheet of paper on one side, of which was a picture of the Good Shepherd and a lamb, and on the other, decoratively framed in red lines, a short prayer which had to be said before beginning to read. Every evening he undressed as quickly as possible in order to have time for his task before the gas was put out. He read industriously, as he read always without criticism, stories of cruelty, deceit, ingratitude, dishonesty, and low cunning. Actions which would have excited his horror in the life about him in the reading passed through his mind without comment, because they were committed under the direct inspiration of God. The method of the League was to alternate a book of the Old Testament with a book of the New, and one night Philip came across these words of Jesus Christ. If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all this, whatever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. They made no particular impression upon him, but it happened that two or three days later, being Sunday, 
the canon in residence chose them for the text of his sermon. Even if Philip had wanted to hear this it would have been impossible, for the boys of King's School sit in the choir, and the pulpit stands at the corner of the transept so that the teacher's back is almost turned to them. The distance also is so great that it needs a man with a fine voice and a knowledge of elocution to make himself heard in the choir, and accordingly to long usage the canons of Turcanbury are chosen for their learning rather than for any qualities which might be of use in a cathedral church. But the words of the text, perhaps because he had read them so short a while before, came clearly enough to Philip's ears, and they seemed on a sudden to have a personal application. He thought about them through most of the sermon, and that night on getting into bed he turned over the pages of the gospel and found once more the passage. Though he believed implicitly everything he saw in print, he had learned already that in the Bible things that said one thing quite clearly, often mysteriously, meant another. There was no one he liked to ask at school, so he kept the question he had in mind till the Christmas holidays, and then one day he made an opportunity. It was after supper and prayers were just finished. Mrs. Carey was counting the eggs that Mary Ann had brought in as usual and writing on each one the date. Philip stood at the table and pretended to turn listlessly the pages of the Bible. "'I say, Uncle William, this passage here, does it really mean that?' He put his finger against it as though he had come across it accidentally. Mr. Carey looked up over his spectacles. He was holding the black stable times in front of the fire. It had come in that evening damp from the press, and the vicar always aired it for ten minutes before he began to read. "'What passage is that?' he asked. "'Why, this about if you have faith you can remove mountains.' "'If it says so in the Bible it is so, Philip,' said Mrs. Carey gently, taking up the plate-basket. Philip looked at his uncle for an answer. "'It's a matter of faith.' "'Do you mean to say that if you really believed you could move mountains you could?' "'By the grace of God.' said the vicar. "'Now say good-night to your uncle, Philip,' said Aunt Louisa. "'You're not wanting to move a mountain to-night, are you?' Philip allowed himself to be kissed on the forehead by his uncle and preceded Mrs. Carey upstairs. He had got the information he wanted. His little room was icy and he shivered when he put on his nightshirt, but he always felt that his prayers were more pleasing to God when he said them under conditions of discomfort. The coldness of his hands and feet were an offering to the Almighty, and to-night he sank on his knees, buried his face in his hands, and prayed to God with all his might that he would make his clubfoot whole. It was a very small thing beside the moving of mountains. He knew that God could do it if he wished, and his own faith was complete. Next morning, finishing his prayers with the same request, he fixed a date for the miracle. O oh God, in thy loving mercy and goodness, if it be thy will, please make my foot all right on the night before I go back to school. He was glad to get his petition into a formula, and he repeated it later in the dining-room during the short pause which the vicar always made after prayers before he rose from his knees. He said it again in the evening and again shivering in his nightshirt before he got into bed. And he believed. For once, he looked forward with eagerness to the end of the holidays. He laughed to himself as he thought of his uncle's astonishment when he ran down the stairs three at a time, and after breakfast he and Aunt Louisa would have to hurry out and buy a new pair of boots. At school they would be astounded. "'Hello, Carrie. What have you done with your foot?' "'Oh, it's all right now,' he would answer casually, as though it were the most natural thing in the world. He would be able to play football his heart leaped as he saw himself running, running, faster than any of the other boys. At the end of the Easter term there were the sports, and he would be able to go in for the races. He rather fancied himself over the hurdles. It would be splendid to be like everyone else, not to be stared at curiously by new boys who did not know about his deformity, nor at the baths in summer to need incredible precautions while he was undressing before he could hide his foot in the water. He prayed with all the power of his soul. No doubts assailed him. He was confident in the word of God. And the night before he was to go back to school 
he went up to bed tremulous with excitement. There was snow on the ground, and Aunt Louisa had allowed herself the unaccustomed luxury of a fire in her bedroom. But in Philip's little room it was so cold that his fingers were numb, and he had great difficulty in undoing his collar. His teeth chattered. The idea came to him that he must do something more than usual to attract the attention of God, and he turned back the rug which was in front of his bed so that he could kneel on the bare boards. And then it struck him that his nightshirt was a softness that might displease his maker, so he took it off and said his prayers naked. When he got into bed he was so cold that for some time he could not sleep, but when he did it was so soundly that Mary Ann had to shake him when she brought in his hot water next morning. She talked to him while she drew the curtains, but he did not answer. He had remembered at once that this was the morning for the miracle. His heart was filled with joy and gratitude. His first instinct was to put down his hand and feel the foot which was whole now, but to do this seemed to doubt the goodness of God. He knew that his foot was well, but at last he made up his mind and with the toes of his right foot he just touched his left. Then he passed his hand over it. He limped downstairs just as Mary Ann was going into the dining-room for prayers, and then sat down to breakfast. "'You're very quiet this morning, Philip,' said Aunt Louisa presently. "'He's thinking of the good breakfast he'll have at school tomorrow,' said the vicar. When Philip answered it was in a way that always irritated his uncle, with something that had nothing to do with the matter in hand. He called it a bad habit of wool-gathering. "'Supposing you'd ask God to do something,' said Philip, and really believed it was going to happen, like moving a mountain, I mean, and you had faith, and it didn't happen. What would it mean?' "'What a funny boy you are,' said Aunt Louisa. "'You asked about moving mountains two or three weeks ago.' "'It would just mean that you hadn't got faith,' answered Uncle William. Philip accepted the explanation. If God had not cured him, it was because he did not really believe. And yet he did not see how he could believe more than he did. But perhaps he had not given God enough time. He had only asked him for nineteen days. In a day or two he began his prayer again, and this time he fixed upon Easter. That was the time of his son's glorious resurrection, and God in his happiness might be mercifully inclined. But now Philip added other means of attaining his desire. He began to wish when he saw a new moon or a dappled horse, and he looked out for shooting stars. During Exeat they had a chicken at the vicarage, and he broke the lucky bone with Aunt Louisa and wished again, each time that his foot might be made whole. He was appealing unconsciously to gods older to his race than the God of Israel, and he bombarded the Almighty with his prayer, at odd times of the day, whenever it occurred to him, in identical words always, for it seemed to him important to make his request in the same terms. But presently the feeling came to him that this time also his faith would not be great enough. He could not resist the doubt that assailed him. He made his own experience into a general rule. I suppose no one ever has faith enough, he said. It was like the salt which his nurse used to tell him about. You could catch any bird by putting salt on his tail, and once he had taken a little bag of it into Kensington Gardens, but he could never get near enough to put the salt on a bird's tail. Before Easter he had given up the struggle. He felt a dull resentment against his uncle for taking him in. The text which spoke of the moving of mountains was just one of those that said one thing and meant another. He thought his uncle had been playing a practical joke on him. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The King's School at Turkhanbury, to which Philip went when he was thirteen, prided itself on its antiquity. It traced its origin to an abbey school founded before the conquest, where the rudiments of learning were taught by Augustine monks. And like many another establishment of this sort, on the destruction of the monasteries it had been reorganized by the officers of King Henry the Eighth, and thus acquired its name. Since then, pursuing its modest course, it had given to the sons of the local gentry and of the professional people of Kent an education sufficient to their needs. 
one or two men of letters beginning with a poet, than whom only Shakespeare had a more splendid genius, and ending with a writer of prose whose view of life had affected profoundly the generation of which Philip was a member, had gone forth from its gates to achieve fame. It had produced one or two eminent lawyers, but eminent lawyers are common, and one or two soldiers of distinction. But during the three centuries since its separation from the monastic order it had trained especially men of the church, bishops, deans, canons, and above all country clergymen. There were boys in the school whose fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers had been educated there, and had all been rectors of parishes in the diocese of Turcanbury, and they came to it with their minds made up already to be ordained. But there were signs notwithstanding that even there changes were coming. For a few, repeating what they had heard at home, said that the church was no longer what it used to be. It wasn't so much the money, but the class of people who went in for it weren't the same, and two or three boys knew curates whose fathers were tradesmen. They'd rather go out to the colonies. In those days the colonies were still the last hope of those who could get nothing to do in England. Then be a curate under some chap who wasn't a gentleman. At King's School, as at Blackstable Vicarage, a tradesman was anyone who was not lucky enough to own land and here a fine distinction was made between the gentleman farmer and the landowner. Or did not follow one of the four professions to which it was possible for a gentleman to belong. Among the day boys, of whom there were about a hundred and fifty, sons of the local gentry and of the men stationed at the depot, those whose fathers were engaged in business were made to feel the degradation of their state. The masters had no patience with modern ideas of education, which they read of sometimes in the Times or the Guardian, and hoped fervently that King's School would remain true to its old traditions. The dead languages were taught with such thoroughness that an old boy seldom thought of Homer or Virgil in after life without a qualm of boredom, and though in the common room at dinner one or two bolder spirits suggested that mathematics were of increasing importance, the general feeling was that they were a less noble study than the classics. Neither German nor chemistry was taught, and French only by the form masters. They could keep order better than a foreigner, and since they knew the grammar as well as any Frenchman, it seemed unimportant that none of them could have got a cup of coffee in the restaurant at Boulogne unless the waiter had known a little English. Geography was taught chiefly by making boys draw maps and this was a favorite occupation, especially when the country dealt with was mountainous. It was possible to waste a great deal of time in drawing the Andes or the Apennines. The masters, graduates of Oxford or Cambridge, were ordained and unmarried. If by chance they wished to marry, they could only do so by accepting one of the smaller livings at the disposal of the chapter. But for many years none of them had cared to leave the refined society of Turcanbury, which, owing to the cavalry depot, had a martial as well as an ecclesiastical tone for the monotony of life in a country rectory, and they were now all men of middle age. The headmaster, on the other hand, was obliged to be married, and he conducted the school till age began to tell upon him. When he retired he was rewarded with a much better living than any of the undermasters could hope for and an honorary canonry. But a year before Philip entered the school a great change had come over it. It had been obvious for some time that Dr. Fleming, who had been headmaster for the quarter of a century, was become too deaf to continue his work to the greater glory of God, and when one of the livings on the outskirts of the city fell vacant, with a stipend of six hundred a year, the chapter offered it to him in such a manner as to imply that they thought it high time for him to retire. He could nurse his ailments comfortably on such an income. Two or three curates who had hoped for preferment told their wives it was scandalous to give a parish that needed a young, strong, and energetic man to an old fellow who knew nothing of parochial work and had feathered his nest already. But the mutterings of the unbeneficed clergy do not reach the ears of a cathedral chapter. And as for the parishioners, they had nothing to say in the matter, and therefore nobody asked for their opinion. 
the Wesleyans and the Baptists both at chapels in the village. When Dr. Fleming was thus disposed of it became necessary to find a successor. It was contrary to the traditions of the school that one of the lower masters should be chosen. The common room was unanimous in desiring the election of Mr. Watson, headmaster of the preparatory school. He could hardly be described as already a master of King's School. They had all known him for twenty years, and there was no danger that he would make a nuisance of himself. But the chapter sprang a surprise in them. It chose a man called Perkins. At first nobody knew who Perkins was, and the name favorably impressed no one. But before the shock of it had passed away it was realized that Perkins was the son of Perkins the linen draper. Dr. Fleming informed the masters just before dinner, and his manner showed his consternation. Such of them as were dining in ate their meal almost in silence, and no reference was made to the matter till the servants had left the room. Then they sat too. The names of those present on this occasion are unimportant, but they had been known to generations of schoolboys as Size, Tar, Winks, Squirts, and Pat. They all knew Tom Perkins. The first thing about him was that he was not a gentleman. They remembered him quite well. He was a small, dark boy with untidy black hair and large eyes. He looked like a gypsy. He had come to the school as a day boy with the best scholarship on their endowment so that his education had cost him nothing. Of course he was brilliant. At every speech day he was loaded with prizes. He was their show boy, and they remembered now bitterly their fear that he would try to get some scholarship at one of the larger public schools and so pass out of their hands. Dr. Fleming had gone to the linen draper his father, they all remembered the shop, Perkins and Cooper, in St. Catherine Street, and said he hoped Tom would remain with them till he went to Oxford. The school was Perkins and Cooper's best customer, and Mr. Perkins was only too glad to give the required assurance. Tom Perkins continued to triumph. He was the finest classical scholar that Dr. Fleming remembered, and on leaving the school took with him the most valuable scholarship they had to offer. He got another and Magdalen and settled down to a brilliant career at the university. The school magazine recorded the distinctions he achieved year after year, and when he got his double first Dr. Fleming himself wrote a few words of eulogy on the front page. It was with greater satisfaction that they welcomed his success, since Perkins and Cooper had fallen upon evil days. Cooper drank like a fish, and just before Tom Perkins took his degree the linen drapers filed their petition in bankruptcy. In due course Tom Perkins took holy orders and entered upon the profession for which he was so admirably suited. He had been an assistant master at Wellington and then at Rugby. But there was quite a difference between welcoming his success at other schools and serving under his leadership in their own. Tar had frequently given him lines, and Squirts had boxed his ears. They could not imagine how the chapter had made such a mistake. No one could be expected to forget that he was the son of a bankrupt linen draper, and the alcoholism of Cooper seemed to increase the disgrace. It was understood that the dean had supported his candidature with zeal, so the dean would probably ask him to dinner. But would the pleasant little diners in the precincts ever be the same when Tom Perkins sat at the table? And what about the depot? He really could not expect officers and gentlemen to receive him as one of themselves. It would do the school incalculable harm. Parents would be dissatisfied, and no one could be surprised if there were wholesale withdrawals. And then the indignity of calling him Mr. Perkins. The masters thought by way of protest of sending in their resignations in a body, but the uneasy fear that they would be accepted with equanimity restrained them. The only thing is to prepare ourselves for changes, said Size, who had conducted the fifth form for five and twenty years with unparalleled incompetence. And when they saw him they were not reassured. Dr. Fleming invited them to meet him at luncheon. He was now a man of thirty-two, tall and lean, but with the same wild and unkempt look they remembered on him as a boy. 
His clothes, ill-made and shabby, were put on untidily. His hair was as black and as long as ever, and he had plainly never learned to brush it. It fell over his forehead with every gesture, and he had a quick movement of the hand with which he pushed it back from his eyes. He had a black moustache and a beard which came high up on his face almost to the cheekbones. He talked to the masters quite easily, as though he had parted from them a week or two before. He was evidently delighted to see them. He seemed unconscious of the strangeness of the position, and appeared not to notice any oddness in being addressed as Mr. Perkins. When he bade them good-bye, one of the masters, for something to say, remarked that he was allowing himself plenty of time to catch his train. "'I want to go round and have a look at the shop,' he answered cheerily. There was a distinct embarrassment. They wondered that he could be so tactless, and to make it worse Dr. Fleming had not heard what he said. His wife shouted it in his ear. "'He wants to go round and look at his father's old shop.' Only Tom Perkins was unconscious of the humiliation which the whole party felt. He turned to Mrs. Fleming. "'Who's got it now, do you know?' She could hardly answer. She was very angry. "'It's still a linen draper's,' she said bitterly. "'Grove is the name. We don't deal there any more. I wonder if he'd let me go over the house. I expect he would if you explain who you are.' It was not till the end of dinner that evening that any reference was made in the common room to the subject that was all in their minds. Then it was Sighs who asked, "'Well,' what did you think of our new head? They thought of the conversation at luncheon. It was hardly a conversation, it was a monologue. Perkins had talked incessantly. He talked very quickly, with a flow of easy words and in a deep, resonant voice. He had a short, odd little laugh which showed his white teeth. They had followed him with difficulty, for his mind darted from subject to subject with a connection they did not always catch. He talked of pedagogics, and this was natural enough, but he had much to say of modern theories in Germany which they had never heard of and received with misgiving. He talked of the classics, but he had been to Greece, and he discoursed of archaeology. He had once spent a winter digging. They could not see how that helped a man to teach boys to pass examination. He talked of politics. It sounded odd to them to hear him compare Lord Beaconsfield's with Alcibiades. He talked of Mr. Gladstone and Home Rule. They realized that he was a liberal. Their hearts sank. He talked of German philosophy and of French fiction. They could not think a man profound whose interests were so diverse. It was Winks who summed up the general impression and put it into a form they all felt conclusively damning. Winks was the master of the upper third, a weak-kneed man with drooping eyelids. He was too tall for his strength and his movements were slow and languid. He gave an impression of lassitude, and his nickname was eminently appropriate. "'He's very enthusiastic,' said Winks. Enthusiasm was ill-bred. Enthusiasm was ungentlemanly. They thought of the Salvation Army with its brain trumpets and its drums. Enthusiasm meant change. They had goose-flesh when they thought of all the pleasant old habits which stood in imminent danger. They hardly dared to look forward to the future. "'He looks more of a gypsy than ever,' said one after a pause. "'I wonder if the dean and chapter knew that he was a radical when they elected him,' another observed bitterly. But conversation halted. They were too much disturbed for words. When Tar and Size were walking together to the chapter house on speech day a week later, Tar, who had a bitter tongue, remarked to his colleague, "'Well, we've seen a good many speech days here, haven't we? I wonder if we shall see another.' Sighs was more melancholy even than usual. "'If anything worth having comes along in the way of a living, I don't mind when I retire.'" End of Chapter 15 Chapter 16 a year passed, and when Philip came to the school the old masters were all in their places, but a good many changes had taken place notwithstanding their stubborn resistance, none the less formidable because it was concealed under an apparent desire to fall in with the new head's ideas. Though the form masters still taught French to the lower school, another master had come, 
with a degree of doctor in philosophy from the University of Heidelberg, and a record of three years spent in a French lycée, to teach French to the upper forms and German to anyone who cared to take it up, instead of Greek. Another master was engaged to teach mathematics more systematically than had been found necessary hitherto. Neither of these was ordained. This was a real revolution, and when the pair arrived the older masters received them with distrust. A laboratory had been fitted up, army classes were instituted, they all said the character of the school was changing, and heaven only knew what further projects Mr. Perkins turned in that untidy head of his. The school was small as public schools go, there were not more than two hundred boarders, and it was difficult for it to grow larger, for it was huddled up against the cathedral. The precincts, with the exception of a house in which some of the masters lodged, were occupied by the cathedral clergy, and there was no more room for building. But Mr. Perkins devised an elaborate scheme by which he might obtain sufficient space to make the school double its present size. He wanted to attract boys from London. He thought it would be good for them to be thrown in contact with the Kentish lads, and it would sharpen the country wits of these. "'It's against all our traditions,' said Size, when Mr. Perkins made the suggestion to him. "'We've rather gone out of our way to avoid the contamination of boys from London.' "'Oh, what nonsense!' said Mr. Perkins. No one had ever told the form master before that he talked nonsense, and he was meditating an acid reply in which perhaps he might insert a veiled reference to hosiery, when Mr. Perkins, in his impetuous way, attacked him outrageously. "'That house in the precincts. If you'd only marry I'd get the chapter to put another couple of stories on, and we'd make dormitories and studies, and your wife could help you.' The elderly clergyman gasped. "'Why should he marry? He was fifty-seven. A man couldn't marry at fifty-seven. He couldn't start looking after a house at his time of life. He didn't want to marry. If the choice lay between that and the country living he would much sooner resign. All he wanted now was peace and quietness. "'I'm not thinking of marrying,' he said. Mr. Perkins looked at him with his dark bright eyes, and if there was a twinkle in them poor size never saw it. "'What a pity! Couldn't you marry to oblige me? It would help me a great deal with the dean and chapter when I suggest rebuilding your house.' But Mr. Perkins' most unpopular innovation was his system of taking occasionally another man's form. He asked it as a favor, but after all it was a favor which could not be refused, and as Tar, otherwise Mr. Turner, said, it was undignified for all parties. He gave no warning, but after morning prayers would say to one of the masters, "'I wonder if you'd mind taking the six today at eleven. We'll change over, shall we?' They did not know whether this was usual at other schools, but certainly it had never been done at Turcanbury. The results were curious. Mr. Turner, who was the first victim, broke the news to his form that the headmaster would take them for Latin that day, and on that pretense that they might like to ask a question or two so that they should not make perfect fools of themselves, spent the last quarter of an hour of the history lesson in construing for them the passage of Livy which had been set for the day. But when he rejoined his class and looked at the paper on which Mr. Perkins had written the marks, a surprise awaited him, for the two boys at the top of the form seemed to have done very ill, while others who had never distinguished themselves before were given full marks. When he asked Eldridge, his cleverest boy, what was the meaning of this, the answer came sullenly. Mr. Perkins never gave us any construing to do. He asked me what I knew about General Gordon. Mr. Turner looked at him in astonishment. The boys evidently felt they had been hardly used, and he could not help agreeing with their silent dissatisfaction. He could not see either what General Gordon had to do with Livy. He hazarded an inquiry afterwards. Eldridge was dreadfully put out because you asked him what he knew about General Gordon, he said to the headmaster with an attempt at a chuckle. Mr. Perkins laughed. I saw that they got to the agrarian laws of Caius Gracchus, and I wondered if they knew anything about the agrarian troubles in Ireland. But all they knew about Ireland was that Dublin was on the Liffey, so I wondered if they'd ever heard of General Gordon. 
Then the hard fact was disclosed that the new head had a mania for general information. He had doubts about the utility of examinations on subjects which had been crammed for the occasion. He wanted common sense. Size grew more worried every month. He could not get the thought out of his head that Mr. Perkins would ask him to fix a day for his marriage, and he hated the attitude the head adopted towards classical literature. There was no doubt that he was a fine scholar, and he was engaged on a work which was quite in the right tradition. He was writing a treatise on the trees in Latin literature, but he talked of it flippantly, as though it were a pastime of no great importance, like billiards which engaged his leisure but was not to be considered with seriousness. And Squirts, the master of the middle third, grew more ill-tempered every day. It was in his form that Philip was put on entering the school. The Reverend B. B. Gordon was a man by nature ill-suited to be a schoolmaster. He was impatient and choleric. With no one to call him to account, with only small boys to face him, he had long lost all power of self-control. He began his work in a rage and ended it in a passion. He was a man of middle height and of a corpulent figure. He had sandy hair worn very short and now growing gray, and a small, bristly moustache. His large face with indistinct features and small blue eyes was naturally red, but during his frequent attacks of anger it grew dark and purple. His nails were bitten to the quick, for while some trembling boy was construing he would sit at his desk shaking with the fury that consumed him and gnaw his fingers. Stories, perhaps exaggerated, were told of his violence, and two years before there had been some excitement in the school when it was heard that one father was threatening a prosecution. He had boxed the ears of a boy named Walters with a book so violently that his hearing was affected, and the boy had to be taken away from the school. The boy's father lived in Turcanbury, and there had been much indignation in the city, the local paper had referred to the matter. But Mr. Walters was only a brewer, so the sympathy was divided. The rest of the boys, for reasons best known to themselves, though they loathed the master, took his side in the affair, and to show their indignation that the school's business had been dealt with outside, made things as uncomfortable as they could for Walters' younger brother, who still remained but Mr. Gordon had only escaped the country living by the skin of his teeth, and he had never hit a boy since. The right the masters possessed to cane boys on the hand was taken away from them, and Squirts could no longer emphasize his anger by beating his desk with the cane. He never did more now than take a boy by the shoulders and shake him. He still made a naughty or refractory lad stand with one arm stretched out for anything from ten minutes to half an hour and he was as violent as before with his tongue. No master could have been more unfitted to teach things to so shy a boy as Philip. He had come to the school with fewer terrors than he had when first he went to Mr. Watson's. He knew a good many boys who had been with him at the preparatory school. He felt more grown up, and instinctively realized that among the larger numbers his deformity would be less noticeable but from the first day Mr. Gordon struck terror in his heart. And the master, quick to discern the boys who were frightened of him, seemed on that account to take a peculiar dislike to him. Philip had enjoyed his work, but now he began to look upon the hours passed in school with horror. Better than risk an answer which might be wrong and excite a storm of abuse from the master, he would sit stupidly silent, and when it came towards his turn to stand up and construe, he grew sick and white with apprehension. His happy moments were those when Mr. Perkins took the form. He was able to gratify the passion for general knowledge which beset the headmaster. He had read all sorts of strange books beyond his years, and often Mr. Perkins, when a question was going round the room, would stop at Philip with a smile that filled the boy with rapture and say, Now, Carrie, you tell them. The good marks he got on these occasions increased Mr. Gordon's indignation. One day it came to Philip's turn to translate, and the master sat there glaring at him and furiously biting his thumb. He was in a ferocious mood. Philip began to speak in a low voice. "'Don't mumble!' shouted the master. 
Something seemed to stick in Philip's throat. Go on, go on, go on. Each time the words were screamed more loudly. The effect was to drive all he knew out of Philip's head, and he looked at the printed page vacantly. Mr. Gordon began to breathe heavily. If you don't know, why don't you say so? Do you know it or not? Did you hear all this construed last time or not? Why don't you speak? Speak, you blockhead, speak! The master seized the arms of his chair and grasped them as though to prevent himself from falling upon Philip. They knew that in past days he often used to seize boys by the throat till they almost choked. The veins in his forehead stood out and his face grew dark and threatening. He was a man insane. Philip had known the passage perfectly the day before, but now he could remember nothing. "'I don't know it,' he gasped. "'Why don't you know it? Let's take the words one by one. We'll soon see if you don't know it.' Philip stood silent, very white, trembling a little, with his head bent down on the book. The master's breathing grew almost stertorous. "'The headmaster says you're clever. I don't know how he sees it. General information. He laughed savagely. I don't know what they put you in his form for, blockhead. He was pleased with the word, and he repeated it at the top of his voice. Blockhead, blockhead, club-footed blockhead. That relieved him a little. He saw Philip redden suddenly. He told him to fetch the black book. Philip put down his Caesar and went silently out. The black book was a somber volume in which the names of boys were written with their misdeeds, and when a name was put down three times it meant a caning. Philip went to the headmaster's house and knocked at his study door. Mr. Perkins was seated at his table. "'May I have the black book, please, sir?' "'There it is,' answered Mr. Perkins, indicating its place by a nod of his head. "'What have you been doing that you shouldn't?' "'I don't know, sir.' Mr. Perkins gave him a quick look, but without answering went on with his work. Philip took the book and went out. When the hour was up, a few minutes later, he brought it back. "'Let me have a look at it,' said the headmaster. "'I see Mr. Gordon has black-booked you for gross impertinence. What was it?' "'I don't know, sir. Mr. Gordon said I was a club-footed blockhead.' Mr. Perkins looked at him again. He wondered whether there was sarcasm behind the boy's reply, but he was still much too shaken. His face was white and his eyes had a look of terrified distress. Mr. Perkins got up and put the book down. As he did so, he took up some photographs. "'A friend of mine sent me some pictures of Athens this morning,' he said casually. "'Look here, there's the Acropolis.' He began explaining to Philip what he saw. The ruin grew vivid with his words. He showed him the theater of Dionysus and explained in what order the people sat and how beyond they could see the blue Aegean. And then suddenly he said, "'I remember Mr. Gordon used to call me a gypsy counter-jumper when I was in his form.' And before Philip, his mind fixed on the photographs, had time to gather the meaning of the remark, Mr. Perkins was showing him a picture of Salamis, and with his finger, a finger of which the nail had a little black edge to it, was pointing out how the Greek ships were placed and how the Persian. End of chapter 16. Recording by Tom Weiss.